Hey there, folks. Welcome to another fun at-home table read. Tonight, we're tackling one of the fun entries of the MCU, Captain America, the first Avenger. We're going to jump right in with our cast tonight on action description. A couple of the characters we've got, Mary Pat. Fantastic. I'm going to be reading for Steve Rogers, hence the, the tiny at the moment. Uh, our Bucky, well, he'll be joining us shortly. As Peggy, Rod or Peggy Carter, we've got Lynn. Fantastic. As the evil Johann Schmidt, we've got Eric. He's right there. Fantastic. As Colonel Phillips, the always popular Tommy Lee Jones, we've got Hunter. Fantastic. As Howard Stark, we've got Jennifer. Yeah. Lovely. As Heinz Kruger, along with Dum Dum Dugan, we got Jared. There he is. Fantastic. As Connie, along with a fun, uh, few other fun characters, we've got Anne. Which is right up there. As Nick Fury, along with Marita, a couple others, we got James. Where are you? Where are they? There they go. As Senator Brandt, along with Private Lorraine, we got Angie. Fantastic. As, uh, well, next a couple of our favorite doctors for the film. As Dr. Erskine, we've got Johnny. And as his evil counterpart, as Dr. Arnim Zola, we've got George. All right, well, Mary Pat, take us away. Captain America, the First Avenger by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Fade in, exterior frozen wasteland day, snow whips, headlights approach. A high tech HMUV grinds through an Arctic snowstorm. The HUV stops. Two shield men get out. The whipping snow is deafening. They can barely see. The search team leader, a civilian, meets them, offering his hand. You guys from Washington? That's some flight. How long have you been on site? Since this morning. An old Russian oil team called it in about uh, 18 hours ago. How come nobody spotted it before? Ice melts. Storm blowing. Landscape changes all the time. The search leader gets a worried look. You mind if I ask what this thing is exactly? Would you believe us if we said it was a weather balloon? No. The shield men stare. A team leader shrugs and walks on. Listen, uh, for the record, I'm not sure we have the equipment for a job like this. Is the sonar up and running yet? Sure. Uh, we're getting deep ice preliminaries now. Uh, very deep. So uh, how long before we can start craning it out? He stops the shield tech, a bit incredulous. I, I don't think you quite understand. The search team leader points at something off screen. Uh, you're going to need one hell of a crane. The two shield men look off screen, awestruck. Reveal a massive wingtip juts from the ice, towering above them like a skyscraper. A skull and tentacle logo is just visible through the ice. German words are stenciled ominously below. Interior frozen plain night. Pitch black. The laser burns through, cutting a hole. The metal circle drops, letting a shaft of light. The two shield operatives from the HUV, HMUV rappel down the ropes. They creep through the frozen, devastated plain. Shattered control screens reflect their flashlights. The lieutenant eyes a panel. Jafar explosive, explosive stuff. This has got to be World War II, but the Luftwaffe didn't have anything nearly this advanced or this big. Lieutenant? Hold that base. The tech chips an off ice flow, then stops. What is it? The lieutenant stares awed. Hey, skip me a line to the colonel. I don't care what time it is. This one's worth waking him up for. He knocks away the last of the ice, revealing a red, white, and blue shield. Exterior frozen wasteland night. A snowcat hauls out a huge block of ice. The shield is barely visible inside. Exterior castle rock tower night. Two Cartesian race across the cobblestones. An ominous clanking fills the air. Watch out the keeper, Harry. 
Title, Norway, May 1942. Jan runs. Eric sets a mauve top down and checks his rifle. The mauve top topples the cobblestones. The ominous clanking rises until a huge tank, the Lands Cruiser, crashes through a building. Eric pales at the Hydra logo. He runs, but machine guns clapped him down. Exterior Castle Rock Tower night, Jan races towards the front door of a lonely stone tower. Interior Castle Rock Tower night, Jan slams down a huge timber crossbeam, locking the door. They're coming! An old tower keeper rushes downstairs. They'll never find it. The two men turn as the ominous clinking rises outside. The land cruiser punches through the wall. Bricks and timber rain down, knocking the keeper back. When the dust settles, the keeper struggles to his feet, only to find Jan dead amidst the rubble. Hydra troops pour in, surrounding him. A dear Castle Rock Tower night. A mortified car pulls up, its hood ornaments a Hydra skull. Gleaming jackpots step out onto the cobblestones. Interior Castle Rock Tower night. The Hydra sol shoulder soldiers throw the keeper down in front of a stone sarcophagus in an ornate crypt. The soldiers try, but fail to push the massive coffin lid. Quickly, before he... Then the footsteps. The soldiers snap to attention as a Hydra officer, Joanne Schmidt, steps through the rubble. His eyes are sunken, his skin pale and waxy. It has taken me a long time to find this place. You should be commended. He stands before the tower, tower keeper. Give me what I want, and you will find the Reich most appreciative. I give you nothing. A Hydra guard moves to clock the old man, but Schmidt waves him off. He leans over the tower keeper. You are a man of great vision. In that, we are much alike. I am nothing like you. Oh, no, no. I would, I don't suggest that. Smith sees his men struggling with the coffin lid. But what others see as superstition, you and I know to be science. The oldest science. What you seek is just a legend. And why do you try so hard to hide it? Smith strides to the coffin. He heaves the heavy lid aside. It smashes to the floor. Inside, a desiccated corpse holds a crystal cube. The Tesseract was the jewel of Odin's treasure room. He turns it over in his hand, curious, then drops it to the floor. It shatters. It is not a thing one buries. He lifts the old man by the shoulder, kissing in his ear. But it is close, yes? I cannot help you. Oh. But you can help them. He turns the old man to see the tank pointing at the town. Your friends out there, grandchildren perhaps. I have no need for them to die. Terrified, the tower keeper lets his eyes flick to a wall. Schmidt lets the old man down. He searches the wall, finally landing on the carving of a tree. Yggdrasil, tree of the world, guardian of wisdom. He scans the roots, finally alighting on a serpent. And fate. He pushes the snake's eyes, releasing a wooden box carved like a snake. The old man sags, defeated. Schmidt opens the box. Blue light emit, illuminates his face. He gazes enraptured. The old man stares, awed. And the Fuhrer digs for the trinkets in the desert. He looks over at the old man. You've never seen it, have you? It's not for the eyes of, of ordinary men. Exactly. Schmidt shuts the box. The light disappears. His, he glances over at the cannon, almost distractedly. Commence firing. A soldier call, 
calls out off screen and the cannon erupts. Enraged, the old man lunges, but he's held back by soldiers. Fool, none of us can control the power. You will burn. I already have. Schmidt draws his Luger with dazzling, dazzling speed. Bam! The keeper drops. The old man's blood has spattered Schmidt's hydra lapel pin. His tentacle death hand is now a red skull. Interior enlistment office, Bayonne, New Jersey day. A paper screams, elite Nazi forces overrun Norwegian town. O'Connell, Michael. The paper flaps down revealing a young man. He stands wearing only boxer shorts. Title, New York City, June 1943. Dozens of half-dressed recruits read newspapers, waiting for their exam results. Another paper, U-boats torpedo ships off coast of Virginia. Polimsky, Henry. Kaminsky stands tossing his paper aside. He glances at the next newspaper down. Pulls on the paper. Nazis burn Czech village to the ground. Kind of makes you think twice about enlisting, huh? Steve Rogers lowers his paper. He's frail and small. Nope. Rogers, Steven. Steve folds the paper and gets to his feet. Time cut. Steve anxiously watches an army doctor scan his file. Close on Steve's file. A dozen ailments have been checked. Uh, what did your father die of? Mustard gas. The doctor looks up. 1918. He was in the 107th Infantry. I was hoping to get assigned to them if... Uh... And your mother? A few years back, she was a nurse in a TV ward. Got hit. Couldn't shake it. Finally, the doctor shakes his head. They weren't weak, doc. They, they were fighters. Like, if you just give me a... Sorry, son. You'd be inintelligible on your asthma alone. You can't do anything? I'm doing it. I'm saving your life. The doctor stamps Steve's file 4F. Interior movie theater, New York City day. Spinning match cut. A swastika flutters on a flag. A newsreel flickers. A column of Nazi stomps down a road. As Hitler's troops continue to ravage occupied Europe. Steve sits in the audience watching intently. On the home front enlistment centers, team with the able-bodied eager to help out our allies. A line of men snakes out a recruiting office. It is trying to get out working for a living. A few rows ahead, a man shouts back at the screen. Steve looks across the aisle. A young woman watches the screen, tears welling. She clearly has a man overseas. Across the aisle, a middle-aged Jewish couple looks somber. Across the seas, our brave boys are already showing the axis that the price of freedom is never too high. Soldiers, some wounded, wave at the camera, their smiles almost convincing. Jeez, play the cartoon already. Steve sees the woman flinch. He whispers to the man. Hey, can you keep it down, please? Together with the Allied forces, they march towards freedom and liberation for millions of grateful citizens. A kid pulls his wagon. A hand-drawn sign says, Scrap Metal. Let them clean up their own mess, the jerks. Steve leans over, fuming. He jabs the man in the shoulder. You want to shut up? The man slowly rises from his slumped position. He rises and rises, revealing... A very large jerk. Exterior movie theater alley, late afternoon. Wham! The jerk hammers Steve in the jaw, knocking him into a line of garbage cans. Steve groans and gets back up. Steve's a natural fighter, bobbing and scoring a kidney punch, but the guy barely feels it. The jerk swings. Steve tries to block him with a trash can lid. The jerk yanks away the lid and pounds him again. Steve's feet lift off the ground. He hits the cement hard. For a moment, Steve lays still. The jerk hovers, panting. Then Steve gets to his feet again. The jerk shakes his head. You just don't know when to give up, do you? Oh. 
I can't hear him. What's Steve? that, Steve? I could do this all day. The jerk knocks Steve back into a pile of garbage. He moves to hit him, but someone grabs his arm. Hey, what's with all the fighting? The jerk spins to see a, sh- a soldier, James Bucky Barnes. Don't you know there's a war on? The jerk takes a swing, but he slings him, spins him around, and plants an army boot into his arse. The jerk runs away. Bucky looks down at Steve getting up from a pile of garbage. Sometimes I think he liked getting punched. I had him on the ropes. As Steve gets up, a folded enlistment form falls from his pocket. Bucky picks it up and reads. How many times is this? And you're from Paramus now? It's still illegal to lie on an enlistment form. And I'm, and seriously, Jersey. Steve frowns, taking in Bucky's uniform. It's like you got your orders. 107th uh, ships to England first thing tomorrow. This is my last night. So what's the first stop? Church? Bucky grins. Yeah, maybe second stop. We start walking out of the alley. Where are we going? He whips out a newspaper and hands it to Steve. The future. Steve opens the newspaper. An ad reads, World Expedition of Tomorrow. Monrails race around the futuristic buildings. Dissolve to Exterior World Exposition of Tomorrow Midway Night. The monorail speeds over an epic fair. Steve and Bucky walk down the busy midway. I don't see what the problem is. You're about to be the last eligible man in New York. You know there are three and a half million women here? I'd settle for just one. Bucky waves at somebody in the distance. Good thing I've taken care of that. Across the midway, two girls wave back in front of the modern Marvel's pavilion. What did you tell her about me? Bucky grins, still waving. Only the good stuff. Interior Marvel's pavilion night. Exhibits line the hall. A glass box holds a red-suited android. Dr. Fianis Horton presents the synthetic man. A fire extinguisher rests at the base. Bucky and two girls, Connie and Bonnie, hurry past the exhibit. Steve tags after, ignored. Bonnie, you should speak up a bit. Oh my God, there he is. The girls squeal, urging Bucky towards. <sighs> Interior Marvel Pavilion, Stark Stage Night. A crowd gathers by a stage. Stark Industrials presents... Steve buys peanuts as Bucky and the girls get in close. On stage, a dashing Howard Stark stands with the 1942 Cadillac. The girls giggle, smitten. Ladies, you know how hard it can be putting on makeup in a car that's bouncing like a kangaroo on a trampoline. Steve offers Bonnie a peanut. She looks at them with scorn. What if I told you that in just a few short years, your automobile wouldn't touch the ground at all? Stark hits a button. The Cadillac rises, leaving its tires on the ground. Bulky devices where the wheels should be. The crowd gasps. Oh, <gasps> Bucky and Steve gape, impressed. Holy cow. With Stark Gravatic Reversion Technology patent pending, you'll be able to do just that. Oh, there's a pop and an explosion. The car slams to the stage. I did say a few years, didn't I? The audience applause. As Bonnie swoons over Howard, Steve looks around sheepish. He spots something in the distance. Bucky wraps his arms around Connie. Hey, Steve, what do you say we treat these ladies to? But Steve is gone. In his place, a little girl digs eagerly into the bag of peanuts. Interior Marvel's Pavilion Recruitment Center Night Steve stares at a mirrored booth in front of the recruiting pavilion. You, duty, hire it on for size, pry it on for size. A burly man stands in front of the mirror. He looks big and heroic in his uniform. Now Steve steps up in the mirror. He now wears a GI uniform. His disappointed eyes barely see over the collar. Aww. Just then, Bucky clamps a hand on his shoulder. 
You're kind of missing the point of a double date. Come on, we're going to get chocolate sodas. You go ahead. Nearby, we see Dr. Erkenstein, a tired looking man in his mid 50s, listening on, in on the argument. Bucky eyes the recruitment signs. You really going to do this now? It's a fair. I'm going to try my luck. As who? Steve from Ohio? They'll catch you, or worse, they'll actually take you. Steve looks at Bucky with a grim smile of disappointment. You don't think I can do it? This isn't some back alley, Steve. It's war. Why, why are you so keen to fight? There's lots of other important jobs. Well, you want me to sit in a factory? Like scrap metal on my little red wagon while my friends are laying down their lives? I can do as well as them, and I got no right to do any less. That's the thing you don't get, Bucky. It's not about me. Right. Because you've got nothing to prove. A tense beat passes between them. Hey, Sarge, we getting sodas? Yeah. Yeah, we are. Annoyed, Bucky walks towards Connie. Then he stops. Torn. Finally, he turns back to Steve. Bucky holds out his hand. Steve sees his friend's genuine worry. He shakes his hand. Promise me you won't do anything stupid before I get back? How can I? Taking all the stupid with you. You're a punk. You're a jerk. A moment, and Bucky turns to go. He spins as he goes for a little, for a last little wave. You don't win the war till I get there. And Bucky goes, swooping up Connie under his arm. Steve turns to the tent. Interior recruitment pavilion night. A young doctor rips a blood pressure cuff off of Steve's arm. You can get dressed. A nurse enters and whispers to the doctor who eyes Steve. Wait here. Am I in trouble? Just wait here. He and the nurse leaves. Steve eyes a poster. It is illegal to falsify your enlistment form. Only traitors lie to their country. As Steve scrambles for his shoes, an MP slides open the curtain. Steve looks up at the towering soldier. I'm in trouble. Dr. Erkenstein enters wearing a lab coat, looking at a file. So you want to go overseas and kill some Nazis? Excuse me? I'm Dr. Abram Erskine. I represent the Strategic Scientific Reserve. Steve Rogers, where are you from? Queens, 73rd and Utopia Parkway. Before that, German. This troubles you? Steve considers this, then shrugs. And where you're from, Mr. Rogers, it's, is it New Haven or Paramus or Five exams in different five different cities. That might not be the right file. It's not the exams I'm interested in. It's the five tries. You didn't answer my question. Do you want to kill Nazis? Is this a test? Yes. I don't like bullies, doctor. I don't care where they're from. There are plenty of big strapping men in this war. What they need, maybe what we need now is the little guy, yeah? Maybe. What do you do exactly? Let's say I believe there is a great potential in every human. It's just a matter of bringing it to the surface. Erskine lays out Steve's file. He reaches for a stamp. I can offer you a chance, but only a chance. That's all I'm asking for. So, really, where's the little guy from? Brooklyn. Stamp, 1A. Exterior Hydra Headquarters Day, establishing. A guard post stands atop a sheer cliff face. Are you ready, Dr. Zola? Interior Hydra, Hydra Headquarters, Schmidt's Office Lab Day. Dr. Arnim Zola's distorted face fills a mirror. My machine requires the most delicate calibration. 
pull back to see Zola actually standing across the room, peering into a camera. The camera is trained at an empty cradle in the center of a complicated machine. Forgive me if I seem overcautious. Johann Schmidt makes adjustments to the conduit attached to a large battery. Are you certain that the conductors would withstand the energy surge long enough for their transference? With this artifact, I am certain of nothing. Zola eyes more conduits, shaking from the battery to a crude cannon. A small wooden target awaits. In fact, I fear this may not work at all. Schmidt glances at the carved box from Norway on a table. And we have lost only time, Doctor. But if it does work. Ancient tomes spread out around it. We can see images of already known, a mammoth tree, a snake hidden in its roots. In a matter of minutes, we might control the power of the gods. Either way. His eyes flick over another engraving. A glowing cube lays waste to a horde of barbarians. It is a moment of terrible possibility. Schmidt then opens the box. Blinding blue light shoots out of it. Zola secures his sunglasses. Schmidt lifts an incredibly bright object of pure energy. He rests it in the cradle. A smoke glass shield drops down, covering the chamber. Through the glass, we now see the outlines of a cube. Schmidt turns a dial. The cube pulses. A gauge marked energy battery glows blue, beginning to rise 20%, 40%, 60%, but the battery remains cold, dark. We are stable at 70%, well within safety parameters. I did not come all this way for safety, doctor. Schmidt reaches over and turns the dial 80%, 90%. At those levels, the power may be uncontrollable. Schmidt cranks the dial 100%. The cube surges outwardly. Power bursts from the cube in a burning flash. It floods the conduits, filling the empty battery with blue energy. Just as it appears, the battery will burst. The energy flashes in a swirling rush of lightning. Schmidt and Zola gape as within the swirling energy, a brief otherworldly vision forms, then zap. The vision winks out as a searing beam shoots from the gun, vaporizing the target, blasting a hole in the wall beyond. Zola pulls a switch. The cube powers down, but the battery still glows, humming with life. Breathless, Zola looks uneasy to where they saw the vision. Did you see? But Schmidt just stares at the destruction around him. He allows himself a smile. Thank you, Doctor. Your designs do not disappoint. The conduit, like the wall of the lab, lie in ruins. So they may require reinforcement. It takes a at a gauge, impressed. The exchange is stable, amazing. The energy we've just collected could power a battleship and battleships. This will change the war. Schmidt pours himself a whiskey, hands shaking. He drinks. No, Dr. Zola, this will change the world. Here, Camp Leahy. Practice field day. Hand over 11 healthy recruits, then dip to find Steve, looking small but determined in army green. Recruits, attention. A woman in a British army uniform, Peggy Carter, strides up. Gentlemen. My name is Agent Carter. I will be supervising your induction today. She passes out papers and clipboards. To begin with, I shall need you to complete this document. Steve reads it. Last will and testament. Two guys next to him look at each other nervously. Steve's not phased. A meaty guy, Hodge, grumbles as he takes his papers.
What's with the accent? Queen Victoria. I thought I was signing up for the U.S. Army. What's your name, soldier? Gilmore Hodge, your majesty. Step forward, Hodge. He does. She indicates where and how he should stand. Right leg forward, arms like so. We gonna wrestle? Cause I got a few moves I, I know you'll like. She comes close, also putting one leg forward. Are you familiar with the art of jujitsu where your opponent's size and momentum are used against him? No. She punches him square in the nose. He drops in a heap, eyes watering, a trickle of blood coming from one nostril. Neither am I. The men titter. <laughs> Steve looks especially pleased. Agent Carter. The men leap to attention as Colonial Phillips approaches, impressive, all military. Erskine's trail behind him. Colonel Phillips. I see you breaking in the candidates. That's good. You, get over there in that line and stand attention until somebody tells you what to do. Todd scurries back. Phillips stands before the men. General Patton has said the wars are fought with weapons won by men. Phillips notices the sickly Steve. He scowls at Erskine. We are going to win this war because we have the best men and because they are going to get better. Much better. In fear camp, Leahy, Barracks Knight, the men are unloading their gear. The men are unloading their gear. Hodge puts up pinups of women. Steve unpacks a stack of well-worn military books. The Strategic Scientific Reserve is an allied effort made up of the best minds in the free world. At Fear Camp Leahy, obstacle course day. Recruits run through an obstacle course. Steve struggles last. The recruits scramble up a cargo net. Steve's foot gets tangled. Hodge climbs over him, smashing his face. From an observation platform, Erskine watches as Steve grimaces but hauls himself up. Our goal is to create the finest army in history. But every army starts with one man. At Fear Camp Leahy, obstacle course day, Peggy checks a stopwatch. The other recruits wait as Steve crawls through mud beneath a barbed wire net. By the end of this week, we're going to choose that man. Hodge kicks out a support. The barbed wire falls on Steve. He's going to be the first. A new breed of super soldiers. And they are personally going to escort Adolf Hitler to the gates of hell. Exterior camp Leahy, practice field day. Steve struggles to do a push-up. Peggy paces as the recruits do calisthenics. I guess I just don't understand the European sense of humor, Doctor. Philip and Erskine walk towards them. You're not thinking of picking Rogers, are you? And more than just thinking about it, he is the clear choice. When you invited a 90 pound asthmatic onto my army base, I'll let it slide because I assume he'd be useful to you, like a gerbil. Never thought he'd pick him. They stop near an open truck, a crate of grenades inside. Put a needle in that guy's arm, it's gonna come out the other side. They watch Steve struggling to do his push ups. Look at him, he's making me cry. I'm searching for qualities beyond the physical. Do you know how long it took to set up this little project? The graveling I had to do in front of Senator Brandt's committee? I'm aware of your efforts. Hodge powers through his push ups. Hodge passed every test we gave him. He's big, he's fast, and takes orders. Short, he's a soldier. He's a bully. Philip stares at Erkstein's a long moment. Then he reaches for the crate in the truck. You don't win wars with niceness, Doctor. You win them with guts. He pulls the pin and hurls the grenade. Grenade! It tumbles in the grass, stopping in front of the recruits. Steve's eyes go wide. The rest of the recruits scramble away. Hodge yelps! He throws himself underneath, underneath a nearby jeep. Peggy makes for the grenade, but Steve gets there first, throwing him, throwing himself on it. Throw me down! Steve waits for the explosion, but nothing happens. After a moment, he opens his eyes, confused. At the truck, Phillips just glares. 
pan to the crate, which we see is clearly labeled M56 training grenades in Ert. Ert gains smiles at Phillips. Hodge peeks out from under the Jeep. Shamed. Wide on Steve, still splayed over the inert grenade. Uh, this is a test? Interior camp Leahy Barracks night. Steve sits alone in his bunk. Around him, 11 other bunks lie stripped, their footlockers empty. Dr. Erkstein enters carrying a bottle of schnapps. Can't sleep. Got the jitters, I guess. Me. Erkstein can indicates his bottle. Me too. Can I ask you a question? Just one? Why me? Erkstein considers this, then he sighs and pulls up a chair. I suppose that is the only question that matters. He motions for Steve to grab a cup of water, couple of water glasses. He holds up the bottle. Made in Osborne, my city. So many people forget that uh, the first country Nazis invaded was their own. I don't excuse what my people have become. After the first war, my people struggled. They felt weak and small that Hitler comes in with the big show, the marching, and he finds me. Here's of my work. You, he says, will make us strong. Interior Research Lab, Berlin, 1938. Flashback. Flash. A slightly younger Erkstein works on a Berlin lab with Johann Schmidt, who wears a Nazi armband. But I am not interested. He sends the head of Hydra, his research division, a brilliant scientist named Johann Schmidt. Schmidt was a member of the inner circle, ambitious, obsessed with the occult, the occult power and Teutonic myth. He and Hitler share a passion for violence and Wagner. Interior camp Leahy, barracks night. Erkskeen sees Steve's black look. Wagner? German operas about war heroes, blood and race, gods afoot upon the earth. Me, I like a little Benny Goodman. Me, I like jets. Steve smiles. Erskine goes on. Hitler uses these fantasies to inspire his followers. But Schmidt, he doesn't believe in fantasy. For him, it's real. Interior Research Lab, Berlin, 1938. Flashback. Flash. Schmidt peruses an ancient tome. He became convinced that a great power had been hidden in the earth left here by the gods, waiting to be seized by a superior man. Flash, he talks to Erkstein, who shakes his head. And when he understood that what my formula could do, Schmidt could not resist. Flash, Schmidt, now in a full Nazi uniform, presses a luger between Erkstein's eyes. He had to become that superior man. Interior camp Leahy barracks night. Erkstein goes silent. He just stares at his hands. Did it make him strong? Yes, but there were other effects. Interior research lab Berlin, 1938, flashback. Flash, Schmidt lies in an exam table, sleeves rolled up. The serum was not ready. But more important, the man. Flash, another Nazi points a gun. Erkstein hesitates. Schmidt yanks the needle from him and injects himself. The serum amplifies what is inside. Flash, Schmidt's eyes bulge. Good becomes great. Flash, his skin burns. He screams. Bad becomes worse. In fear camp, Leahy barracks night. Erkstein pours schnapps into the two glasses Steve holds. This is why you were chosen. A strong man. He might lose respect for the power if, we, if he had it all his life. But a weak man knows the value of strength and compassion. Thanks. I think. Erkstein chuckles and puts his glasses on. Whatever happens tomorrow, promise me that you'll stay who you are, not a perfect soldier. He taps Steve's chest with one finger, looking into his eyes. 
but a good man. Steve clinks his glass with Erkstein. To the little guys. They move to drink, but Erkstein remembers something and grabs Steve's glass before he can take a sip. What am I doing? You have a procedure tomorrow. No fluids. We'll, we'll drink it after. He pours Steve's drink into his. I don't have a procedure tomorrow. This is very good. I'll save you a little. Let's hear Hydra headquarters day. We hear the overture from Wagner's Das Rengud. Climb down the cliffside to a big bay window on the rock. Through the glass, we see an artist painting of an easel. We hear knocking. Yeah. In here, Hydra headquarters, Schmidt's office lab continuous. A record spins on a phonograph. Dr. Zola hesitates, enters the office lab and stops. Don't stare, doctor. An artist paints Schmidt's portrait. Tell it all shades of red. Is it something in particular? I understand you found him. See for yourself. On the table, Zola finds surveillance shots of Ernstine in New York in a cab buying a hot dog, being escorted by MPs. Zola looks up at Johann Schmidt standing silhouetted in front of the window. We can't make out his face. You disapprove. Berlin doesn't feel this is a proper use of their resources. And you are now their loyal servant. Berlin, if they care, can discuss it with me personally. I just don't see why you need concern yourself. I can't imagine he'll succeed again. His serum is the ally's only defense against the power we now possess. If we take it away, our victory is assured. Zola nods, resigned. Shall I give the order? It's already been given. Zola smiles tightly and heads for the door, then... Dr. Zola, what do you think? Zola glances at the artist, who looks queasy and frightened. Zola peeks at the painting, which we do not see. A masterpiece. Next year, Brooklyn Street Day. Kids scramble out of the streets as a black sedan passes. In tier black sedan day, Steve rides with Peggy, staring out at the familiar streets. Oh, I know this neighborhood. I got beat up in that alley. And that vacant lot. Oh, I'm behind that diner. Did you have something against running away? You start running, I'll never let you stop. You stand up, you push back, and then we tell you no for so long, right? I know a bit what that's like, to have every door shut in your face. Who shut the door on you? I figure I'd be climbing over each other to hold them open. Depends on which door you're trying to go through. I guess I don't know why a beautiful agent, uh, why would she want to join the army anyhow? She could do whatever she wanted. You don't know an awful lot about women, do you? Tell me all wrong, Agent Carter. I don't know anything about women. It's probably the longest conversation I've had with one. She is laughing just the teeniest bit. I wish I were kidding. Think about it. I don't have any money, so I can't take it to dinner. I'm kind of short. That doesn't help ever. And I don't dance, so that's off the table. You must have at least danced. Standing on my mom's feet when I was seven. I don't know. Asking the girl to dance seemed so terrifying. And then the last few years, it didn't seem so important. I figured I might as well wait. For what? He shrugs, looking out the window. Right, partner. He doesn't see that his this affects her. The car slows. The sit. Exterior Brooklyn Street Day. The sedan pulls up to an antique store. Two bums loll near the entrance. Two men in suits stand near a row of cars. Steve climbs out, confused. Why do we stop here? Love a bargain. 
perhaps redecorating. Interior antique store day. The bell over the door rings. The antique store owner nods at Peggy and Steve. Lovely weather this morning, isn't it? Yes, but I always carry an umbrella. I suppose you can't be too careful. Best be prepared for a shift in the wind. Looking for anything in particular? A dozen eggs and your finest selection of cheese. I'm afraid you'd better try the nearest farm. I buy my milk at the store. The code exchange, the women press a button under the counter where a submachine gun hangs hidden. Peggy leads Steve through a door in the back. Into your antique store, security foyer day. They find a Marine guarding a huge metal door. As the door whooshes open, the Marine salutes. Interior rebirth lab day. Steve steps out onto a raised platform and gapes. The huge, ultra modern rebirth lab stretches beneath them, far larger than the store outside. It's always bigger inside. Techs operate machinery. Engineers man monitors. A film crew sets up. They all look respectfully at Steve. His eyes alight on the rebirth device. Glittering lenses surround a man-shaped cradle. Pneumatic panels fold below. Six Vita rays retractors loom behind. Dr. Ernstine scurries about at the center of all prepping. Steve takes it all in, looking over an observation booth where a group of men gather. Interior observation booth day. Senator Bandit confers with his aides. A man with glasses waits a little behind. Philip enters. Senator Brandt, glad you can make it. Why exactly am I in Brooklyn? Philip looked down at the machine below. We needed access to the city's power grid. Of course, if you'd given us the generator I requisitioned. A lot of people ask me for funds, Colonel. Oh, this is Clem. The man sticks his hand out as Brandt fundles, fumbles the name. Fred Clemson, State Department. If this project of yours comes through, we'd like to make sure it's used for something other than headlines. Philip nods as Brandit, Brandit peers through the window of the lab. He spots Steve. Jeez, somebody get that kid a sandwich. In here, Rebirth Lab Day, Erskine helps Steve until the device. Comfortable? Steve looks small in the outline of a much larger man. You saved me any of that schnapps? <sighs> Not as much as I should have. Erkin nods to the attendants who hook up Steve, then looks to a man in a suit making adjustments. How are your levels, Mr. Stark? The man steps out from behind the device. Steve blinks, surprised. It's Howard Stark! Oils are at peak, levels are at 100%. We may dim half the lights in Brooklyn, but we're ready, as we'll ever be. Steve eyes him warily. It was you at the expo. Did you write that Cadillac in the air? Had her flying three full minutes. Then what happened? Then we landed, technically. He pats Steve on the sho shoulder. Steve isn't reassured. Erskine jostles a nervous Peggy as he tries to squeeze past. Uh, Agent Carter, wouldn't you be more comfortable in the booth? She gets the hint. She smiles at Steve. Steve smiles back. Erskine pulls down an overhead microphone. He looks to the booth, waiting until Phillips is standing near a speaker. He taps hard on the mic. Phillips uh, winces, holding his ear. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, we do not take another step towards annihilation. Today, we take the first step on the path to peace. Interior observation booth day. Brandit watches, skeptical. We will begin with a series of micro injections to the subject's major muscle groups. Peggy enters, Clemson offers his seat. Interior rebirth lab day. Stark and his older assistants ready the machinery. The engineers check their monitors and irk bleep an e Hey, G bleeps. The serum will cause an immediate cellular change. 
In order to prevent uncontrolled growth, the subject will then be saturated with Vita rays. He clicks off the microphone and nods to a nurse. She opens a case revealing a gleaming aluminum syringe. She taps the needle, pulls back the plunger, and injects Steve in the arm. He winces, then relaxes. That wasn't so bad. That was a tetanus shot. A panel slides back, revealing a carousel of blue vials. Seven tubes of serum stand at the ready. Erskine and the nurse insert six vials into the injectors. Erskine nods at a tech who deploys the injector pads. They bristle with hundreds of tiny needle tips. They close over Steve, pressing him to the table. Beginning the serum infusion in five, four, three, two, one. He presses a switch. The injection pads click. Steve jerks as unseen needles deploy. The blue fluid slowly empties from the serum injectors. Steve's veins swell. His head begins to shake. Erskine hits another button. Padded restraints close in on Steve's head, holding him still. Steve's wide-eyed glow of intense blue. Finally, the injector vials empty completely. Now, Mr. Stark. Stark pulls the lever. The table slowly tilts upright. Steve rises like a rocket, ready to launch. The panels unfold. A hood lowers over Steve's head, sealing him inside the Vita chamber. The window frames, the window frames Steve's face. Erskine talks into a mic. Steven, can you hear me? Is it too late to go to the bathroom? We shall proceed. Stark throws a switch. His Vita ray contractors come online. Finally, Stark turns the power dial. A piercing whine fills the room. On a huge gauge, the needle begins to climb. 10, 20, Steve's face goes tense. Inside the chamber, orange light builds in intensity. Technician pull on goggles. Peggy crosses her fingers. 30, 40, Steve's eyes squeeze tight as the pain grows. Erskine checks Steve's vitals. He nods to Stark, who turns the dial higher. 50, 60. Steve's head snaps back, seizing. The EKG beeps faster and faster. Peggy stands worried. Her breath fogs the glass. 70, 80. The glow surges, flooding the window, hiding Steve. The EKG shrieks. 90. A screams close from the speaker. Erskine rushes to the window, but we can't see in. He barks into the microphone. Steven! Steven! He rushes out to the booth and down the stairs. Shut it down! The lights get brighter. The viewers shield their eyes. Mr. Stark, kill the reactors. Suddenly, everyone in the lab hears. No! In the booth, Brandit and Phillips exchange an amazed look. Don't! Stark's hand hovers over the dial. How do you do this? Erskine swallows. With great hesitation, he nods to Stark. Stark gives the dial a final turn. One hundred. The wine splits the air. The bitter ray chamber flashes from orange to white. And then it all goes dark. The wine dies, as does the EKG. Erskine goes ashen. Stark stares at him, hit at his and on the dial. Peggy swallows. Even Phillips looks saddened. And then a sound rises, then steady beep of the EKG. The lights rise. Erskine hurries to the device. Mr. Stark. Stark hits a button. The hood and panels retract, releasing a blast of steam. When it clears, Erskine can see a new man hanging in the straps. Muscular, tall, perfect. His head rests against the chest, his chest, eyes closed. Interior observation booth day. Everyone gasps and hurries out, except the man with glasses. He opens a cigarette case and flicks a switch. A red light blinks. He snaps it shut and magnets it to the chair bottom. Interior rebirth lab day. The technicians undo the straps. Steve collapses into Erkstein's arm. The old man staggers. 
Stephen? Doc, did it? I, th I think yes. You did it, Doctor. You really did it. The others rush into the lab. Phillips looks to brand it. They got up early now, Senator. I can think of some folks in Berlin who are about to get very nervous. Peggy brings Steve his clothes. He puts on his old, now much smaller shirt. How do you feel? Steve groggily looks down at her. Taller. He pulls on his clothes. The man with glasses enters the lab. Across the room, he spies the remaining two but unused serum. He flicks open a lighter, revealing a button. Erskine hears the click of the lighter. He turns. Please, don't smoke him. Erskine sees the man with glasses. He looks puzzled, then flash. Kruger holds a gun during the Berlin experiment. No. Kruger pushes the button. Interior observation booth day. The cigarette case makes an ominous click. Interior rebirth lab day. The booth explodes, shooting fire and glass into the lab. Phillips, Phillips shoves Brandon out of the way. Peggy pulls a pistol. Erskine sees Kruger making for the serum. He bolts to get to it first. Kruger draws a pistol and shoots the old man down. No! Erskine flies back, smashing into the machinery. Kruger snatches the last tube and races for the door. Phillips pulls a gun, winging Kruger as he escapes. Steve bolts to Erskine, checking his wound. Doc. Steve cradles Erskine, who stares through the broken glass. He takes in the result of his effort. He smiles, weak but proud. He reaches out and taps Steve's chest. He stops, dead now. Steve stares for a moment, then looks up, filling with quiet rage. Interior antique store day. Kruger bursts out the rear door. The antique lady pulls her submachine gun. Kruger cuts her down and grabs her gun. Exterior Brooklyn Street day. Kruger races outside to find the two suited men blocking his way. I have it. Get the car. Chanel. Kruger and his men sprint for Bandit's motorcade. The two bums we saw earlier draw guns. Bolt. They open fire, nailing one of the Kruger's men. Kruger and his remain, remaining men peel out. The guards fire, blowing out the car's window. Kruger fires the submachine gun out the shattered windows, killing one of the bums. Interior antique store day. Peggy races for the door just as Kruger dives past. Drives past. Interior car day. Kruger hits the button on his lighter. Exterior Brooklyn Street day. The motorcade explodes incinerating the other bum. Interior antique store day. The windows shatter, showering Peggy with glass. Exterior Brooklyn Street. Kruger's car speeds away as Peggy rushes to the street. She draws a bead on the receding car. Blam. Interior car day. The back window shatters. The driver's head snaps into the steering wheel. Beep. A bullet in his brain. Kruger hands on, hangs on as he careens toward a parked car. Smash! Here at Brooklyn Street Day, a taxi squeals up. The cab driver runs to Kruger's driver. Hey, buddy, are you? He runs himself in the wreck and jumps into the cab. The cabbie looks up to see his taxi roaring away. Guns leveled, Peggy advances down the street. Kruger aims the cab, aims, Kruger aims the cab at Peggy. She stands her ground, squeezing off shots. The taxi keeps coming. Just then, Steve leaps through the flaming wreckage and tackles Peggy out of the way. The cab fishtails around the bend. Peggy shoves at Steve. I had him! Steve gets up but falls again, his new body big and awkward. Furious, he takes off after the cab. Into your taxi cab day. Kruger skids around the corner. The serum rolls wildly in the seat. He snatches it up and sticks it in his front pocket. Exterior Brooklyn Street Day. Peggy stops the sedan. A man rolls down the window. Stay out of the room. There's some hay. She yanks him out and grabs the wheel, peeling out. Interior Brooklyn Alley Day. Steve veers down an alley, taking a shortcut. He spots Kruger's cab racing past the mouth of the alley. Steve pours it, pours it on, picking up speed. Exterior Brooklyn Street Day. 
Steve rockets back onto the window, on, onto the street, careening out of control, right towards a shop window. In fear, Brooklyn shop day. Steve crashes through the window, tumbling into the shop. Exterior Brooklyn Street Day. Steve races out the shop door, bare feet pounding the pavement. He passes a speeding car. Kruger swerves past the parked truck. Pedestrians dive out, dive away as the cab veers into the sidewalk. Steve races between lanes of traffic. Kruger swerves off the sidewalk, smashing a fire hydrant. Steve follows, tearing down the street right at Interior old man's car day. An old man gapes as Steve runs right up his hood. Exterior Brooklyn Street day. Steve vaults off the car roof and lands on the taxi. Interior exterior taxi cab day. Kruger pulls his gun and blasts at Steve. Steve ducks, clinging to the side of the car. He swerves through the street. A horn blares. Kruger looks to see a truck roaring at him. Steve sees the same thing. Kruger yanks the wheel. The truck sideswipes the taxi, throwing into a roll. Kids look over from their bowl game to see Steve atop the tumbling cab, riding it like a rolling log. The car crashes to a stop. A here, Riverside Dock Day. Steve struggles to his feet. A bloody Kruger stumbles out of the wreck, firing. Across the way, tourists wait in line for the Statue of Liberty Ferry. They gape. A bullet kicks the concrete at Steve's feet. He picks up a torn off taxi door, holding it like a shield. One tourist snaps a photo. Kruger fires at Steve, the bullets ripping through the shield door. Shrapnel tears at Steve, but he just keeps coming. Finally, Kruger turns and runs. It's your pier parking lot day. Kruger shoves through the pack of waiting tourists. Hey, watch it, mister. Kruger grabs the smallest boy, putting the gun to his temple. Steve stops. He locks eyes with the scared, scrawny kid. Exterior Brooklyn Pier Day. Kruger drags the kid to the water. Steve follows, relentless. Kruger points at the gun, points the gun at Steve. Put empty. Kruger hurls the kid into the drink. Steve races to save him. Kruger presses his lighter again. A one-man submarine surfaces. He scrambles down to it. Steve spots the kid, gripping the ladder. Go get him! I can swim! Steve spots the departing mini-sum. He scowls. Great. I can't. In fear of mini-sub day, the sub dives, propellers whirling. Kruger pilots beneath the hull of a cramped steamer. Exterior Brooklyn Pier Day. Steve sprints the length of the dock and dives. Interior, exterior, mini sub day. Torpedo, torpedo in. Into the water, Steve kicks for the sub. Kruger smiles to himself, pleased at his getaway until wham! The, slub, the sub lurches. Kruger looks behind him to see Steve holding on to the tail fin. Kruger pushes the stick, diving. Steve hangs on tight. He punches the cockpit glass. Boom, boom, again and again. Steve punches one last time. The glass spider webs around his fist. Kruger rages as the water pulls, pours in. Steve hugs on the latch, opening the cockpit. He pulls Kruger out and kicks for the surface. The sub plows into the silty river bottom. Next year, Brooklyn Pier Day. Steve throws Kruger to the dock. Kruger whirls around with a knife. Steve kicks him. The knife and the serum go flying. The serum vial smashes on the dock. Kruger watches the blue liquid drip through the cracks. Bam. Steve rolls Kruger over, putting a knee into the Nazi's chest. Who the hell are you? The first of many. Cut off one head. Kruger presses his tongue against a false tooth. And two more shall take its place. He bites down on a cyanide pill. Hail Hydra. Steve's eyes go wide as Kruger seizes up and dies. Steve looks down at himself, stunned at his new body. He stands alone on the pier, a man transformed. Just then, Peggy squeals up in the sedan. She jumps out and runs to Steve. More jeeps full of MPs screech in. Interior Hydra Headquarters Corridor Day. Three Nazi officers, Roeder, Schneider, and Hutter, 
I, a Hydra banner with distaste as they stalk after Schmidt, who never stops walking. The fear fears your continued disregard of military protocol is unacceptable. They pass imposing Hydra troopers posted along the hall. You serve at his pleasure. He gave you this facility as a reward for your injuries. Reward? You may call it what it really is, an exile. I no longer reflect his image of Aryan perfection. You think this is about appearances. Your Hydra division has failed to deliver so much more as a rifle in more than a year. We had to learn through your local intelligence that you had mounted a full-scale incursion into Norway. The Fuhrer feels, how does he put it? The Red Skull has been indulged long enough. Schmidt finally stops, turns and glares at Schneider. You came to see the results of our work. Come, let me show you. He leads them to a door marked Ajinwate Ide Mechanic. Two massive guards stand on either side. Interior Hydra headquarters, Schmidt's office lab continuous. Schmidt leads them inside where Zola and several techs work on a blue cube generator amidst complicated machinery. Hitler speaks of a thousand year Reich, yet he cannot feed his armies for a month. His troops spill blood by the gallons across every field in Europe, yet he gets no closer to achieving his goals. And I suppose you still aim to win this war through magic? Science. Though I understand your confusion, great power has always baffled primitive men. He gestures to the complicated machinery. Hydra has perfected a weapon which can destroy my enemies in one swift, brutal stroke. Wherever they are, no matter how many forces they possess, or in a matter of hours. Your enemies? Schmidt indicated a map marked with red pins. I know we are enough destructive force to decimate every hostile capital on Earth simultaneously. Quite simply, gentlemen, I have harnessed the power of the gods. The Nazis eye each other. Thank you, Schmidt. For what? For making it clear how obviously mad you are. Hutter studies the map. The ladies on this map! Schmidt looks calmly from one Nazi to another. So it is. Schmidt pushes the switch. A cannon rises from the apparatus. Its chamber glows a familiar hue. You will be punished for your insolence. The device rotates towards the officers calibrating. You will be brought before the Fuhrer himself. The cannon blows Hutter to mist. The other Nazis scramble. Schneider jumps away as the cannon fires. It misses. Schmidt frowns. He starts to pull his Luger. Then Schneider trips. The cannon aims again. Bam! Rotor backs up uh, towards the wall. Schmidt! Bam! Schmidt gazes down at the dead Nazis, impassive. He turns to Zola and the Hydra techs, who stare shocked. My apologies, Doctor. Be we both knew Hydra would grow no further in Hitler's shadow. Hell Hydra! The techs step forward, giving a two-armed salute. Hail Hydra! Hail Hydra! Zola, carefully considering the moment, finally he relents, offering a measured Hydra salute. Hail Hydra! In here, SSR warehouse office day. Through a window, we see Howard Stark in coveralls and goggles, slowly taking apart the Hydra mini sub. Pull back. Steve stares down at him, and SSR doctor and nurse draw blood from his arm. Peggy watches with concern. Think you got enough? The nurse fills the vial, resting it beside a dozen others. All of Dr. Erskine's research and equipment is gone. 
Any hope of reproducing the program is locked in your genetic code. It would take years. At the moment, you're the only super soldier there is. Steve rolls down his sleeve. On the desk, he sees Erkstein's shattered glasses. Hirsch can deserve more than that. If it could work only once, he'd be proud it was you. A quiet moment lingers. In fear SSR warehouse day, Stark works as Philip enters, Brandon and his aides on his heels. Colonel Phillips, my committee is demanding answers. Great. Why don't we start with how a German spy got a ride to my secret installation in your car? Brandon frowns, shuts up. Philip turns to Stark as Steve and Peggy join them. What have we got? Well, speaking modestly, I'd say I'm the best mechanical engineer in the country. Stark opens a hatch. Impressive. Circuit. Circuitry. Circuit. Yeah. Blink inside. Circuit City. Yeah. Yep. Yes, Back. Circuit City. <laughs> Radio Shack. Hi. Anyway, and I've got no idea what any of this is or how it works, but nowhere near capable of this technology. Then who is? Hadra. Brandon looks at him blankly. I'm sure you've read our briefings. I'm on a number of committees, Colonel. Well, I'll let Agent Carter fill you in. Hydra is the Nazi Deep Science Division. It's led by Dr. Erskine's first test subject, Johann Schmidt. Schmidt. Hydra's practically a cult. They worship Schmidt, think he's invincible. So what are you going to do about it? I spoke to the president this morning. As of today, the SSR is being retasked. Colonel? We're taking the fight to Hydra. Pack your bags, Agent. You two start. Three of us fly to London tonight. Sir, if you're going after Schmidt, I want in. You're an experiment. We're sending you to a lab. What a lab? The serum worked. As for an army, all I got is you. And you are not enough. Steve looks sunk. Brandit waves his aid over. With all due respect, Colonel, I think we, are, we might be missing the point. You've seen Steve here in action. More importantly, the country's seen it. Brandit's aides hand over a copy of the New York Examiner. Nazi saboteur foiled. Mystery man saves civilians. In the photo, Steve deflects gunfire fire with a starred car door. Enlistment lines have been around the block since this hit the newsstands. You don't take a soldier, a symbol, like this and hide it in a lab. Steve looks surprised. He didn't expect Brandit to step up for him. Brandit turns on a charm, becoming the consummate politician. He needs to be out there showing the world what, America's, what American fighting men is made of. Son, do you want to serve your country on the most important battlefield in this war? It's all I want. Then congratulations, you just got promoted. Off Steve's smile. In tear small theater backstage day, close on Steve's face. He sweats, sick to his stomach. I don't know if I can do this. Grant's aide stands beside him. Ah, oh, there's nothing to it. You sell a few bonds, uh, bonds buy a few bullets, bullets kill a few Nazis, bing, bang, boom, you're an American hero. Steve swallows hard. Not how I pictured going out there. Senator's got a lot of pull on the hill. Play ball with us and you'll be leading your own platoon in no time. Steve considers this a huge as a bugle plays. In tier small theater day, the curtains part. After a long, awkward moment, Steve stumbles through the curtains as if shoved. He wears red boots and gloves, a blue costume with a star and striped shirt and a mask with wings. Dancing girls in short skirts look expectant. Steve stares at the small audience, dismayed. In the crowd, Senator Brandit looks pleased. Steve glances over his shoulder. Brandit's aide gives him the thumbs up. The girls sing, introducing our hero. Who's so strong and brave and here to save the American way? Steve checks the cue nice. card taped inside his triangular shield. Who's fighting to keep you safe at home? Who vowed to fight like a man who's Right, what's right night and day? Thanks, roommate, for getting home right now. 
It's the American <laughs> soldier, that's who. We'll campaign door to door for America. I'm just going to keep on going with this. Carry the flag shore to shore for America from Hoboken to Spokane. Fuck Hoboken. Uh, and Star Spangled Man with a plan. Yeah. Montage. City name spiral pass. The song continues and the theaters get bigger. Buffalo. Steve poses for a photo <laughs> with a crying baby. After the flash bandit's aide hands him another baby. A sign reads, Take a snap with cap. Flash. Now Bandit elbows his way in, throwing his arms around Steve, grinning at the camera. Milwaukee. Steve stands at the center of the stage as dancing girls circle him, waving their tiny flags. Black and white footage. Steve marches with the troops on a war-torn battlefield. Fade to color. Reveal he's marching on a treadmill on a movie set. Fake. The world Hollywood spirals up. Kansas City. On stage, Steve takes in the mic confident. We all know this isn't about having a swell afternoon. It's about winning the war. Suddenly, a kid stands up in his seat. Panicked, he points at Hitler, creeping from the wings. Steve doesn't notice. But we can't do it with bullets and bandages. Without tanks and tents. That's where you come in. More kids stand now, shouting, look out! Each bond you buy protects someone you love. Our boys can be armed or ready. Just then, Hitler rushes him. And so the Germans will think twice before they try and get the drop on us. He spins and fake socks Hitler in the jaw. The Fuhrer goes down. The audience goes wild. Steve looks out at the adoring fans, soaking it all in. A stack of Captain America's number one featuring Cap stalking Hitler down at the newsstand. Kids clamor for a copy. Zalthia in a lobby. Kids yell for Steve's autograph. Steve in costume but with cowl down hands his shield to Bandit's aid. The aid sags under the weight of the heavy metal slab. Hey, Cap, my brother says you took out four German tanks all by yourself. Sorry, kid. Tell your brother I think he's wrong. The kid sags, disappointed. Steve grins. It was eight German tanks. The kids cheer. Yay! A movie magazine gets shoved in Steve's face. Its, co the, its cover features him. Who's Cap? Now, a smaller photo shows a lonely Howard Stark. Has Howard lost his playboy crown? Steve looks up to see a beautiful blonde holding a pen. She smiles. So does he. He go, my hometown. Captain America battles on the movie screen. Steve watches for the crowd. He glances around at rapt faces. New York City. Radio City Music Hall. Three chorus girls sing their hearts out wearing blue helmets that spell out USA. Pull back to see they're sitting on a motorcycle and Steve is holding that motorcycle over his head. Reveal the wide stage of Radio City Music Hall and a lavish production number, the grand finale. How many of you are ready to help me sock old Adolf on the jaw? Here, U.S. camp makeshift stage day. Steve stands alone on stage, confident, but instead of applause, he receives dead silence. Continues. Title: Italy, October 1943. Five miles from the front, hundreds of battle-hardened GIs stare at the man in red, white, and blue pajamas. Okay, uh, I'm gonna need a volunteer. I already volunteered. How do you think I got here? The crowd laughs. Steve stiffens. Bring the girls back! I think they only know the one song, but uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do. You do that, sweetheart! In the crowd, Hodge nudges the GI next to him. Where did they get these guys? The guy next to him shrugs. They boo. boo. The rest boo. of 
The rest of the crowd joins in. Steve looks bewildered, trying to keep order. Hey, guys, we're all on the same side. (laughs) Hey, Captain, sign this for me. (laughs) The guy moons him. The GIs laugh. Somebody throws a tomato. Steve has to block it with his shield. As they chant, bring back the girls, becomes a roar. Exterior U.S. camp makeshift stage day. Rain falls. Steve, in an overcoat, sits on the edge of the stage. He sketches a chimp dressed as a as Cap, running, riding a unicycle. That was quite a performance. Steve turns to see Peggy. He stands surprised. Yeah, had to improvise a bit. The crowds I'm used to are usually more. 12. I understand you're America's new hope. He sees his cap suit is exposed. He shuts his coat and sits. People buy bonds, bonds buy bullets, bullets kill Nazis. Sales rise 10% in every state I visit. Is that Senator Brandt I hear? Hey, if Phil's is gonna stick me in a lab, at least Brandt got me, at, got me here. Are those your only options? Lab rat or dancing monkey? You know you're meant for more than this. Steve takes this in, finally. It's just, you get enough people telling you you're a hero after years of them telling you you're nothing. All I dreamed about was coming overseas, being on the front line, serving my country. Finally get everything I wanted, and I'm wearing tights. Steve looks up, seeing a platoon of tired, wounded soldiers. An ambulance rolls up to the hospital tent. Corpsmen unload the wounded on stretchers. Looks like they've been through hell. These men more than most. Steve eyes her, understanding. Hydra? Not officially. Back home, that's a yes. She considers protocol, but leans near him instead. Schmidt was moving a force through Azano. 200 men went up against them. Less than 50 came back. Your audience contained all that's left of the 107th. The rest were killed or captured. The 107th? Yes. What? He stands, pulling her up as well. Come on. In pure U.S. camp Phillips' tent, late afternoon, a corporal types... At a desk across the tent, Colonial Phillips signs a stack of letters. Just then, Steve barrels in, Peggy behind. Well, if it isn't the star-spangled man with a plan, what is your plan today? Rosano, I want to see the casualty list. Phillips points to the rank insignia on his collar. You don't get to give me orders, Captain? I don't need to see the whole list, just one name. Starts with James Barnes from the 107th. You and I are going to have a conversation later that you won't enjoy. Just tell me if he's alive, sir. B-A-R-N-E-S. Do not spell it me, son. Peggy sees Steve's resolve. She turns to Phillips. Sir, Rogers is only on loan to the USO. Officially, he's still SSR. Phillips stares at Steve. Finally, he relents. Barnes. Steve nods. Phillips picks up a thick sheaf of letters, leafing through the first few. I've signed more condolence letters today than I care to count. The name does sound familiar. I'm sorry. Steve pales, Philip's words sinking in. He stares at a map of Australia, or Austria, on the wall, alongside aerial photos of a facility. What about the others? You planning a rescue mission? Yeah, it's called When in the War. But if you know where they are... They're 30 miles behind the enemy lines through some of the most heavily fortified territory in Europe. We'd lose more men than we save. I don't expect you to understand that, though, because you are a chorus girl. I think I understand pretty well. I understand it somewhere else. If I read the posters right, you've got some place to be in half an hour. Yes, sir, I do. He exits, taking one last look at the maps as he goes. Phillips goes back to signing letters. You got something to say, now's the time to keep it to yourself. Push in on Peggy's face as he 
considers the situation. Exterior U.S. camp makeshift stage backstage night. Musicians hustle as Brandit's aide searches for Steve. Where the hell is Rogers? Anyone seen him? He grabs the three girls from the motorcycle number. Get out there now, stall! The first girl hurries to a shelf and grabs her U helmet. The second girl grabs her S helmet. And the last girl reaches the chef's shelf to find it empty. She looks around for her missing A helmet. What's my helmet? Exterior Lockhead Electra Knight. Lockheed Electra Knight. A silver Lockheed Electra cuts through the clouds. Interior Lockheed Electra Knight. The A helmet from the USO sh- the USO show sits on a bench. Beside it, Steve Buttons fatigues over his cap shirt. The Hydra camp is in Crossburg, tucked between two mountain ranges. It's a factory of some kind. Reveal Peggy sitting across from him, studying a map. Howard Stark leans back from the controls. We should be able to drop you right on the doorstep. Just give me as close as you can. You know, you're both going to be in a lot of trouble when you land. And you're not. Yeah, but where I'm landing, if anybody yells at me, I get to shoot them. They're undoubtedly going to shoot back. He shows her his shield strapped to his back. That's got to be good for something. Agent Carter, if you're not too much in a hurry, uh, I thought we'd uh, stop in Lucerne for a late night fondue. Howard grins. Steve's a little tweaked. Why is he saying fondue like that? What's fondue? Stark's the best civilian pilot I've ever seen and mad enough to brave this airspace. We're lucky to have him. So do you, I mean, are you two fondue? Take this transponder, activate it when you're ready and the signal will lead us right to you. Steve looks at the insignia, Stark Industries. Sure it works? been tested more than you have bam the plane lurches to the left exterior mountains night anti-aircraft guns hammer the plane interior lockheed electra night howard ex- executes evasive maneuvers steve straps on his parachute and throws open the jump door rogers get back here we're taking you all the way in explosions rock the air steve hesitates realizing what he's about to do. Bam! He turns to Peggy. Once I'm clear, turn this thing around and get out of here. You can't give me orders. I can't. Bam! The plane lurches just once more, just as Steve jumps. In fear, Lockheed Electra night, Peggy catches a glimpse of Steve's chute. She swears under her breath, then signals Howard, who hauls on the throttle. Up here, Hydra Factory night. Searchlights sweep from watchtowers. A barbed wire fence rings a compound of buildings. A factory belches smoke. Interior Hydra Factory floor night. Hydra Tech loads blue cartridges cartridges into a cluster bomb, then gently loads the cluster bomb into a nose cone. As you see, production is proceeding faultlessly. Zola and Schmidt walk the factory floor. Catwalks radiate from a control room overhead. Even an ordinance of this size. Good. Increase output by 60%. See to it our other facilities do the same. But our workers, I'm not sure they have the strength. POWs labor at gunpoint. A giant crane loads bombs into a rail car. Then use what strength they have left, Doctor. There are always more workers. Exterior Hydra Factory main gate night. Steve peers out at the guards patrolling the main gate. He drops as headlights sweep the road. Three cover trucks rumble towards the gate. A gate guard checks the driver's papers. In the background, we spy... Steve sneaking into the last truck. Exterior Hydra Factory Compound Night. 
The trucks roll into the compound, gates closing behind them. Guards hurry out to unload the trucks. As the last truck, one guard peers in, curious. A red, white, and blue shield stands among the supplies. Wham! The shield springs out, smashing him in the face. The guard drops. Steve emerges from the darkness. Exterior Hydra Factory compound night. Hydra guards prod POWs across the compound. Steve follows, keeping to the shadows. At the barracks, one guard stands watch as the other leads the prisoners inside. Inferior Hydra Factory, barracks night. A warder opens a cage and prods the prisoners in. A prisoner in a hat brings up the rear, slow. The warder hits him with a truncheon, knocking off his bowler. The prisoner picks up his hat and puts it back on. We now see it's Dum Dum Degon. Dun, 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 dun. He stares at the warder. You know, Fritz, one of these days I'm going to get my own stick. The warder viciously kicks Duggan inside. Down the rows, a hundred more prisoners are trapped in a dozen more cages. Exterior Hydra Factory compound night. The guard steps out to find his partner sleeping against the wall, helmet over his eyes. He kicks at him, but the guard doesn't move. He lifts his partner's helmet to see he's out cold. Steve steps up behind him with a truncheon and crack. Interior Hydra Factory Barracks Night. Four prisoners, False Wars, Jones, Dreiner, and Duggan slump on the floor of their cages, exhausted. The wardener on the upper floor makes his rounds. He passes out of sight, then what? The warder drops on top of the cages, unconscious. The prisoners jump up as Steve looks down at them. Hi. The prisoners stare, stunned. Who the fuck is this? Jones raises an eyebrow at Steve's outfit and shield. <laughs> the hell are you supposed to be? I'm uh, Captain America. The prisoner's excitement dies. Merd. In fear, Hydra Factory barracks night. Freed prisoners follow Steve as he makes his way down the row, opening cages with the guard's keys. He releases Falseworth, Jones, Dreiner, and Duggan. Duggan spots a Japanese-American soldier, Mortia, already free. More what are we taking, everybody? I'm from Fresno, Ace. Steve searches the throng of prisoners. Are there any others? They did take a number of the men in isolation work. I'm afraid we haven't seen them since. Steve considers this as the prisoners gather around. Finally, he hands them a pistol and grenades. All right, look, the tree line is northwest about 80 yards from the gate. From there, just follow the creek bed. Lead to the clearing uh, with everybody one night, uh, with everybody I find inside. Jones stops him. Wait, you sure you know what you're doing? Sure. I've knocked out of Hitler over 200 times. Steve moves out. Exterior Hydra fac Factory night. Steve circles the factory, looking for a way in. Interior Hydra Factory floor night. A Hydra guard stands watch near a door. He hears tapping. A silhouette appears behind the glass. The guard cautiously opens the door and pokes his head out. Yeah? The door slams, pinning his head. The guard looks up to see Steve's fist coming right at him. Wham! Steve enters the factory, creeping between bombs and crates. Clusters of cartridges bristle inside an unfinished bomb. Steve pulls one out, curious. It glows blue in his hand. He pockets the cartridge and heads for the stairs. Exterior half-track night. Duggan slams a hydra guard into the grill of a half-track dryer and Fallsworth climbs up climbs up the top. Reiner settles behind the complicated looking weapon. Are you quite sure you know how to use that? Reiner peers at the grip. Bam! The cannon discharges, blowing a smoking hole in the factory wall. What? Interior Hydra Factory control room night. On a monitor, the factory wall burns. Schmidt scans his security cameras. He presses a button, sounding the alarm outside. At the controls behind him, Zola looks worried. Interior Hydra Factory stairs night. A guard rushes down the stairs, his jackboots almost crushing Steve's fingers. 
Steve hangs under the staircase. Steve yanks the guard's ankle. He tumbles down the stairs. Interior Hydra Factory catwalk night. Steve steps up into the catwalk, only to be met by another guard pointing a pistol. Steve knocks the gun from his hand and smashes him in the face. The guard falls, flips back up, and charges. Steve swings from a beam and kicks the guard in the chest. Interior half-track night. Duggan stares at the German controls, baffled. Just then, Jogan slides into the passenger seat. Not exactly a Buick. That one, uh, Zundung. You speak German? Uh, natürlich spreche ich Deutsch. Uh, three semesters at Howard. Then uh, switch to French. <laughs> Cuter girls. Duggan pushes Zunding. The half-track roars to life. Didn't ask for a resume. Seer half-track night. Fallsworth and Drenner hang on as the half-track lurches forward. Interior Hydra Factory catwalk night. Steve looks over the factory floor, looking in the full scale of the bomb-making facility. Just then, two more soldiers attack from either side. The first guard fires. Steve drops and shoots at him. The second guard closes in. Steve whirls and crushes his neck with the side of his shield. Interior Hydra Factory control room night. Schmidt surveys the uprising in his monitors. Outside, the guards struggle to fend off escaping POWs. Inside, a strangely clad soldier takes on three guards. Schmidt adjusts his screen. Steve hits one guard, kicks another, then uses him to deflect the blast of a third. More in on Schmidt's face as he studies Steve. Impressed. I think Hoha needs to speak Locked up a up. bit. They have to evacuate. I'm sure our forces can handle. Hi, Steve on the monitor. Steve dispatches the last guard and heads up the stairs. Our forces are outmatched. Schmidt presses a button. Alarms now blare inside the factory. Zola hurries out of the room. Schmidt flips the switches on the line of timers. Flash bin each of them starts a countdown. Then he turns. The cube pulses in a cradle behind smoking glass. He lowers a titanium case over the cradle. It retracts the cube, plunging the interior of the factory into darkness. Exterior Hydra Factory compound night. Hydra's guards fill the compound, taking on POWs. Mortia throwing a grenade, blowing the guards away. Interior Hydra Factory, Zola's experiment room night. Zola's rifled through a filing cabinet on the corner of a tiled room. He gathers a sheaf of documents. We glimpse a sketch of a TV-chested robotic suit. Beyond Zola, a shadowy figure lies slumped in a cage. Exterior Hydra Factory, Zola's experiment room, corridor night. Steve reaches the corridor. At the far end, Zola scurries out of his room, files pressed to his chest. Zola sees Steve. Steve advances. Zola runs the other way. Interior factory, Zola's experiment room night. Steve stalks inside wary, pasta scattering files and specimen jars. He sees the large cage atop a rusty drain. A prisoner lies slumped against the bars. On hearing Steve's footfalls, he calls out wearily. Barnes, James Buchanan, <clears throat> Sergeant 325-5738. Steve gapes, stunned. He cannot believe it. Bucky? Silence. The prisoner doesn't respond, then. Who? Who is that? Steve races to the cage. We can now clearly see a beaten, grizzlied Buck Bucky Barnes staring out. Bucky squints, unable to focus. He seems to have aged 10 years. Is that? Steve smashes off the lock. He holds out his hand, grinning. Me, Buck. Bucky studies his friend's face. Steve? I thought you were dead. I thought you were smaller. Steve gently helps him down from the cage. Buck gapes at his transformed, much taller friend. What happened to you? I joined the army. Into your Hydra factory, control room night. The first of the timers reached zero. It beeps. Interior Hydra Factory Floor Night. One of the machines on the factory floor explodes. 
Inferior Hydra Factory, Zola's Experiment Room Night. Steve and Bucky stagger as the blast shake the room. They head out. Steve spots a huge map featuring a series of Hydra symbols spreading across Europe. Interior Hydra Factory Corridor Night. Steve helps Bucky limp down the corridor. More bombs go off. Did it hurt? A little bit. Is it permanent? So far. You're going to get so many girls. Interior Hydra Factory Stairs Night. Bucky and Steve reach for the stairs. They head down, but another explosion blocks their way. They head back up, spotting a catwalk high above. Exterior Hydra Factory Compound Night. Morita leads a group of POWs towards the main gate. He hears something roaring up behind them. He looks. Down! He tackles a POW to the ground as zap, a blue blast just clears their head, blowing away the main gate. Behind the cannon, Reiner and Falseworth swoop politely. POWs swarm the gate. It's your Hydra Factory Catwalk Night. Steve and Bucky reach the catwalk only to find Schmidt on the other side. Zola waits behind him at the elevator. Captain America, how exciting. I'm a fan of your films. Schmidt hands the titanium box to Zola. He and Steve slowly walk forward, studying each other. So the old man managed it after all. Not quite an improvement, but impressive. Steve hits Schmidt in the jaw, sending him reeling. You've got no idea. Schmidt straightens up, strangely pleased. Don't I? Schmidt swings, but Steve blocks it with his shield. Schmidt first leaves a dent in the steel. He gapes, surprised. Then he looks up. Schmidt hammers him. Steve goes down. Schmidt looms over him. Erskine said your experiment was a failure. Steve kicks up, driving his feet into Schmidt's jaw. Bam! Schmidt tumbles to the floor. Zola scrambles to the catwalk controls. A gap appears between Schmidt and Steve as both sides retract. Schmidt shoots a withering look at Zola. Zola pales. When Schmidt turns back to Steve, his face is askew. Red skin bulges from torn seams. A failure. Oh no, Captain. He gets to his feet. I was his greatest success. He pulls, peeling his face from the bone, revealing a red skull underneath. He grins, hideous. Steve stares in disbelief. Oh, you don't have one of those, do you? Bucky gapes, then looks at Steve worriedly. Red skull tosses his mask away. Johann Schmidt's face wafts into flames. Staring at us as it falls. You're a liar, Captain. You pretend to be a simple soldier. But in reality, you're just afraid to admit we've left humanity behind. Another explosion rocks the floor below. Unlike you, I embrace it proudly. Without the masquerade. Without fear. And how come you're running? Steve scowls from the end of the catwalk, helpless. Zola hands Skull back his titanium box. Then the two of them step into the elevator and disappear. Steve pulls Bucky away as explosions rock the catwalk. They spot a gantry above. Exterior Hydra factory roof night. Zola eyes Skull's exposed head, wheezy. Finally, he looks away and notices the floor indicator. Sir, we're going to the roof. Skull remains silent. The doors open, revealing a catwalk leading to a waiting Trifenflugel, built for one. But what about me? Skull hands Zola a set of car keys. Not a scratch, Doctor. Not a scratch. Skull exits the elevator. Zola stares at the keys as the doors close. Interior Hydra Factory, top gantry night. Steve and Bucky reach the gantry. Bucky runs on. It creaks. Steve steps on. Hurry. Carefully, Bucky limps across the gantry. Rivets fall. Exterior Hydra Factory, woods night. Morita leads the injured POWs towards the woods. Just then, 
Something roars overhead. He looks up at the trifle flugel. It rotates, rotating engines whirling in a blur. Interior trifle flugel night. Skull glances out the cockpit. Below his factory burns, he can just make out a car speeding down a lonely road. Interior Schmidt's car night. Flies, slide on the seat as Zola speeds away. His feet barely reach the pedals. Files. Interior Hydro Factory top gantry night. Bucky jumps from the end of the gantry to the other side. Just then, another bottom explodes. The gantry collapses. Steve stands alone, trapped. Bucky looks around, frantic. There's got to be a rope or something. Just get out. The explosions come faster now. Boom. Boom. Not without you. The roof around Steve falls in. His is the impossible gap. Hell. He backs up then races for the edge. Bucky's eyes go wide as Steve leaps. Chaos just as the biggest bomb yet goes up. Oh. Interior U.S. Camp Phillips Tent Day. Phillips stares out his window, stoic. Senator Brand, I regret to report that Captain Steve Stephen G. Rogers went missing behind enemy lines on the 3rd of last week. He looks down to read the rough draft on his notepad. We see that he's dictating to the corporal. Error reconnaissance has proven unfruitful. As a result, I must declare Captain Rogers killed in action. The corporal stops typing. Phillips turns to see Peggy standing in the door, red-eyed and tired. The last surveillance flight is back. She enters and lays down aerial pictures of the disintegrated Hydra camp. No sign of activity. Phillips gazes at the photos. Then he looks at the corporal. Corporal, why don't you go get a cup of coffee? The corporal nods and leaves the room. I can't touch Stark. He's a civilian and the Army's number one contractor. You are neither. You'll have my resignation in the morning. I can probably make it so that you'll avoid a court martial. With respect, sir. I don't regret my actions, and I doubt Captain Rogers did either. What makes you think I give a damn about your opinions? Peggy goes cold. Philip steps forward. I took a chance on you, Agent Carter. Now that boy and a lot of other men are dead because you had a crush. It wasn't that. I had faith. Well, I hope that's a great comfort to you when they shut this division down. A commotion builds outside. What the hell's going on out there? Soldiers running by Philip's window. He and Peggy move closer to look. Exterior U.S. Camp Day. Phillips and Peggy step outside to see dozens of soldiers hurrying towards the camp entrance. The soldiers part, revealing Steve and Bucky walking up the road, leading a squad of POWs. Ragtag vehicles follow, carrying the rest. Steve's uniform hangs filthy and torn. His shield is battered and bent, but his head is high. GIs cheer. More come running. Todd steps out from the, ba bar the barracks, drying his hair. He stops. Done. Obvious? Amazed, Phillips looks to Peggy, who wipes away tears. The stunned crowd parts. Steve salutes Phillips. Colonel, some of these men need medical attention. Phillips looks at the gaunt faces of the men. He nods. Medics rush in to help the POWs. I'd like to surrender myself for disciplinary action. Phillips looks at Steve's battered burn shield. That won't be necessary. Sir, I... Just how many orders do you plan on disobeying, Captain? Steve and Phillips lock eyes. Steve smiles. Yes, sir. Phillips turns to Peggy, smiling wryly. Faith, huh? He walks away as Steve turns to Peggy. She stops herself from hugging him. You're late. He pulls out the Stark transport ponder. It's shot to pieces. Sorry, couldn't call my ride. They stare at each other for a long, lingering moment. Then 
soldiers, including those who booed him at the USO show, crowd around, slapping Steve on the back. They wave his comic book, yelling for Captain America. Flash bulbs pop. Steve smiles despite himself. Finally accepted. A pretty nurse approaches Bucky. Where do you hurt, soldier? A slow smile creeps across his face. Exterior Allied Headquarters Day. Barrage balloons fly high over London, tilt down to an imposing building, a newsstand in front of flogs, a paper. Captain America to receive Medal of Honor. Tilt down further through the pavement to Interior Allied Headquarters Briefing Room Day, a briefing room in an underground bunker. And the fourth one was in Poland here, not far from the Baltic. Peggy watches Steve sketch precise coordinates on a map, perfectly duplicating the one in the Hydra, f- in the Hydra factory. And the last one was outside of Strasbourg, say 34 miles west of the uh, Maginot line. I, I only got a quick look. Nobody's perfect. An aide picks up the map and carries it across the room. Steve and Peggy turn as Howard Stark approaches, a blue Hydra cartridge in his hand. Hey, aren't you supposed to be uh, picking up a metal right about now? I'm off the publicity circuit. Just then, Phillips approaches from across the room. Rogers, you just embarrassed a senior senator in front of a dozen reporters and 10 members of parliament. He hands Steve a medal. Should get a medal just for that. He sees the Hydra cartridge. We figure out what it is yet? Do you believe Rogers? It's apparently the most powerful explosive known to man. If? Well, either you're wrong or Schmidt's damn near rewritten the laws of physics. He moves off for the lab. Yep, yep. Sorry, girl. Well, I am uh, rather fond of the laws of physics. Phillips moves towards the room size map table. Are all of Hydra's factories? The ones we know about. But Sergeant Barnes said Hydra shipped all the bombs to another facility. And that wasn't on the map. Philip studies the map, deciding, then walks towards his office. Agent Carter, coordinate with MI6. I want every Allied eyeball looking for that main Hydra base. What about us? We're going to light a fire under Johann Schmidt's ass. What do you say, Rogers? It's your map. You can wipe Hydra off it. Steve stares, finally given the responsibility he's wanted. You're going to need a team. We've already started to line up the best men. If you don't mind, sir, so have I. Exterior, the whip and fiddle pub night. Let me get this straight. Interior, the whip and fiddle pub night. Falsworth, Jones, Durner, Morita and Duggan lean on stools. Steve lines up at the dartboard. We barely got out of there alive. And you want us to go back? <clears throat> Steve weighs a dart, then casually tosses a bullseye. Pretty much. The men look at each other for a long, pregnant moment. Sounds rather good. Sounds rather a good time, actually. I'm in. Steve eyes Drainer, questioning. Drainer nods. Je comprends ce que le dernier de ces batailles c'est moi. Et je ne brille que plus comme un nouveau né. J'espère que tu as froid. Drainer laughs, clapping Jones on the shoulder. When they look up, they see the others not understanding word. Oh, uh, we're in. Dum Dum Dagon finishes a beer, mustache ca- covered in foam. I'll fight. Well, I'll always fight. But you got to do one thing for me. What's that? He hands over his empty pint glass. Open a tab. The others laugh and hand Steve theirs. Steve grins and takes the glasses back to the bar where Bucky waits. Steve slides over the empties. Another round? The bartender looks impressed. Uh, 
well, uh, you drink all of these yourself. Uh, where are you going to put all this? Uh, you know, it is possible to run out. You know, my keg's almost out. Steve shrugs and turns to Bucky. That was the easiest battle of the war. What about you? You join Captain America into the Jaws of Death? Hell no. That little guy from Brooklyn who was too dumb to run away from a fight. I'm following him. Bucky nods at a tour poster of Captain America. Performance canceled, not to be rescheduled. But, but you're keeping this out there, right? Don't get your hopes up. It's not exactly regulation. I don't know. You saw those guys in Italy when you came back. I don't think they were cheering just for you. The invaders sing, arms wrapped drunkenly around each other. One by one, they stop as they notice Peggy enters the bar. Out of uniform, she looks fantastic. Steve is the last to see her. Captain? Agent Carter. Ma'am. Howard's got some equipment for you to try. Tomorrow morning. That sounds fine. The invader starts singing again, terribly. I see your crack squad is prepping for duty. You don't like music? I do, actually. I may even, when this is all over, go dancing. Bucky grins and nods at the dance floor. Well, what are we waiting for? The right partner. She smiles at Steve and heads out. Oh, 800 hours, Captain. Yes, ma'am. I'll be there. Bucky stares, puzzled. Steve pats him on the sh shoulder. Maybe she's got a friend. I'm invisible. Inferior Allied Headquarters, Stark's Lab Day. Robot claws handle the cube cartridge inside a blast chamber. Outside, Howard examines it as his engineer takes note. Mission signature is unusual. Alpha. Beta and gamma ray neutral, though I doubt Rogers picked up on that. Edward gently removes a glowing pellet. Looks harmless enough. Howard steers the robot claw, extending a sparking wire. Hard to see what all the fuss is about. Ooh. He touches the wire to the pellet. Boom! An explosion blows out the windows of the blast chamber and sends Howard slamming against the far wall. When the dust settles, Howard looks over at his engineer. Write that down. The engineer writes it down. Interior Allied Headquarters Day. A pretty WAC PVT Lorraine reads Stars and Stripes POW Camp Liberated Miracle trek across enemy lines. Excuse me, I was looking for Mr. Stark. I think he went to look for a broom. He looks up, the real life Steve standing over her. She slips into a smile. Of course, you're welcome to wait. Steve sits, hesitant. Lorraine swivels in her chair. He watches her legs cross. I read about what you did. Oh, um, doing what needed to be done. Sounded like a lot more than that. You saved nearly 200 men. Really, it wasn't a big thing. Tell that to their wives. I don't think they were all married. You're a hero. Despite himself, Steve smiles. Well, maybe, depending on whose definition. The women of America owe you their thanks. And seeing as they're not here. Steve's eyes go wide as she leans in and kisses him. He stiffens and gives in. When they come up for air, Peggy is standing by the desk. Uh-oh, busted. Lorraine leaps back, flustered. Peggy just stares coldly. Captain, we're ready for you, if you're not otherwise occupied. She stalks out the door. Interior Allied Headquarters hallway continuous. Peggy clicks down the hall. Uh, Agent Carter, wait a second. She doesn't break stride. Steve catches up to her. Looks like finding a partner wasn't that hard after all. Peggy, that wasn't what you thought it was. 
I don't think anything, Captain. Not one thing. She continues towards a metal door at the end of the hall. You wanted to be a soldier. Now you are one, just like all the rest. Steve stops, flustered and upset. What about you and Stark? How do I know you two haven't been fondueing the whole time? Peggy whips around, cold. You still don't understand a bloody thing about women. She storms down the corridor. Steve watches her, too, at a loss. Fondue's just cheese and bread, my friend. Steve turns. Howard Stark stands in the now open metal door. And it looks to me like she thinks that you've got a lot more going for you than that. Interior Allied Headquarters, Stark's lab day. Howard leads Steve across the brand new lab. Fondue is just cheese and bread, my friend. I'll tell you again. Stark's text unwrap and install futuristic machines. And again, it sounds like she thinks you've got more going for you than that. Workers replace the blast shattered windows. Mechanics tune up a motorcycle. Really, I, I, I didn't think... Nor should you, pal. The minute you think you know what's in a woman's head is the minute your goose is well and truly cooked. Howard stops Steve at a collection of high-tech fabrics. Me? I concentrate on work, which at the moment is making sure that you and your men don't get killed. He unrolls an impressive gray metallic weave. Carbon polymer. Ought to hold its own against your average German bayonet. Of course, Hydra's not likely to come at you with a pocket knife. He turns to Steve's battered shield lying on a work table. I hear you're sort of attached. Steve fingers a bullet hole. Yeah, it's handier than you might think. So the hotel's chambermaid, or well, so is she, yeah. Um, uh, and I wouldn't take her into battle. He pulls up a chart with a number of shields, some built, some half finished, including the one with the Iron Man two. I took the liberty of coming up with a few options. This one's fun. It's fitted with a trans transitorized relays. Steve pulls out a plain round shield from the bottom shelf. He spins it between his palms. It's light, balanced. Steve pings the simple shield. It rings like a bell. What about this one? Uh, it's just a prototype. Now, uh, this one. Uh, it's made of vibranium stronger than steel and a third of the weight steve slides the shield onto his arm it's completely vibration absorbent it should make a bullet feel like a cotton ball behind them peggy enters the lab well, it's not standard issue it's the rarest metal on earth you're holding all we got peggy reaches them i see are you about finished mr stock I'm sure the captain has some unfinished business. Steve smiles. He doesn't. He lifts the shield. So what do you think? Peggy looks at him, expressionless. Then she turns to a table of guns, picks up one, and fires at Steve's chest. Bam, bam, bam. He blocks them. The slugs flatten and plink to the ground. I think it works. He stalks out of the room. Steve and Howard watch her go for a long moment. Got my uniform. He hands Howard a sketch. Neither takes his eyes off Peggy. I had some ideas. Whatever you want, sport. Cut to montage. Interior Hydro Factory, France Day. A door crashes open, revealing Steve dressed in his red, white, and blue battle uniform. Firing a Tommy gun. Title, France, December 1943. Bullets ping off his red, white, and blue vibranium shield. The invaders pour in behind him, blasting away. Interior Allied Headquarters Briefing Room Day. Peggy replaces an X with an SSR flag on the Hydra map. Exterior Hydra Factory Belgium Day. Steve and the invaders fan out across the blazing battleground, wreaking havoc. Title, Belgium, January 1944. Time cut. 
Skull roars up to the ruined factory in his car. He glares at the destruction on his windshield reflection and reflects in the flame. Here, Hydra Factory, Poland Day, through a sniper scope. Steve stalks a bombed out factory. Title, Poland, February, 1944. The scope whips to see a Hydra gunman aiming at Steve. Blam! The sniper falls. Steve clocks it and gives the thumbs up to the camera. Reverse, Bucky grins behind the gun. Interior Allied Headquarters Briefing Room Day. Peggy replaces another X with an SSR flag. She looks down to the next X, somewhere in Poland. Here, Hydra Factory, Czechoslovakia Day. The invaders scramble out the side doors of the Hydra Factory. They dive for cover and wait. No explosion. They peer out from their cover. Where the hell is Steve? Then Steve crashes through the factory windows on his motorcycle. Boom! The factory behind him explodes. He hits the ground, roaring towards the camera. Title, Czechoslovakia, August 1944. Here, frozen woods day. The woods stand white and silent. Then six white figures rise out of the snow like ghosts. The invaders shake off the snow and creep forward. Then a seventh figure rises, Steve in full red, white, and blue. Blam! A, fi a rifle cracks. A bullet pings off his shield. Steve spins and hurls his shield. Whoop! A hydra sniper falls out of a far tree. The invaders gape. Interior Allied Headquarters Briefing Room Day. Peggy drops a hydra flag into a box and picks up an SSR flag. She sticks it on the map. Exterior Hydra Factory Day. Stephen Jones ride on the back of, Jeep, of a Jeep as Duncan drives away from the burning factory. A Hydra fighter plane swoops over them, guns blazing. Steve blocks it with his shield as Jones opens up his 30 cal. The plane bears down. Jones stitches it up the middle. It catches fire, spins out of control, and crashes ahead of them. Duncan slows to a stop. The three of them stare, impressed. Dear Forest Day, Reiner runs through the woods, a bomb tucked under his arm. Parallel to him, a Hydra fast track races along the road. Dreiner rolls under the fast track. He magnets the bomb to the bottom of the vehicle as it roars over him. He jumps to his feet in time to see the fast track explode. Next year, Battlefield Day. The invaders race across the field as the land cruiser bears down on them. They're almost to safety when Dungan's hat flies off his head, landing in the path of the oncoming tank. Duncan runs back for it. The rest of the men shot. Duncan dies, grabbing the bowler and rolling out of the way. He wedges the hat on his head, smug. Then he realized the tank has turned and is coming right From nowhere, Steve dives over Duncan and grabs the tank's cannon barrel. He flips himself in the air and lands on top of the turret. Steve stops a glowing energy housing mark, explosive. He raises his shield high and brings it down. Wham! The tank grinds to a halt. Steve rises his shield again. Smash! The house crackles. Sparks fly. Steve brings the shield down one last time. Boom! An ominous drone begins to rise. Steve takes a running leap off the tails as the tank explodes. Fade to black and white. We find we're in interior Allied Headquarters briefing room day. Pull back to find Peggy and Phillips watching the footage. The camera moves past Fallsworth and Dreiner drinking from their canteens. Duncan drinks from a flask. Bucky and Steve survey a valley. The camera focuses on Steve's open compass. Taped to the inside is a newspaper photograph of bum bum bum, Peggy. Peggy leans forward, shocked. The camera whips up. Steve stares right at, right at us, pissed. He snaps the compass shut. Philip eyes Peggy, amused. She stares at the screen and smiles. Interior Hydra Factory Grease Night. Extreme close on the skull screaming, a horror movie jump from the last image. You are failing. Bullock cringes before him. Around him, Hydra troops search the rubble for another burned factory. You're close to an offensive that will shake the planet, Doctor. 
yet we are continually delayed because you can't outwit a simpleton with a shield. Gola gestures at the devastated facility. Sir, this is hardly my area of expertise. I merely developed the weapons. I cannot fire them. And the Allies did not take this installation easily. Your troops fought to the death. Now they are dead. I trust you see the problem. Finish your mission, Doctor, before the American finishes his. He puts his hands on either side of Zola's head, squeezing a little, bringing their faces close. You have done great things. Do this one more. Zola contemplates his task. Ugh. The troops haul the injured plant manager, Velt, from the rubble. Gold bid them forward. We fought to the last man. Zola cringes as Skull puts, pulls his luger. Very nearly. Zola turns away, his face illuminated briefly by an inevitable flash of blue light. Exterior Alpine Pass Day, close on the captured Hydra Code transceiver. Title, Russia, January 1945. Steve and the invaders gather on a high plateau. Morita crouches over the transceiver. Jones listens to the transmission. Fallsworth wields binoculars. Dungan and Dreiner adjust a winch at the cliff's edge. Steve and Bucky stand in conversation we can't hear yet. The engineer, the engineer just radioed ahead. Hydra dispatch gave him permission to open the throttle. Whatever's on this train, they must need it bad. Well, they're not going to get it. I wouldn't be so sure. Binoculars, point of view. In the distance, we can see a far off speeding train. Because they're moving it like the devil. Steve checks his rifle. Bucky looks over the cliff edge. Remember that time I made you ride the cyclone at Coney Island? I threw up. Bucky looks over the edge again. Leery. This isn't payback, is it? Steve looks up with a grin. And why would I do a thing like that? Jerk. Punk. A train whistles, shrieks through the pass. Binoculars point of view, a futuristic hydro train approaches. All aboard, gentlemen, mind the gap. Steve, Bucky, and Jones attach T-bars to the cable. Okay, this is a very short, very fast train. We got a 10-second window tops. Miss Timon, you're bugging a windshield. Duggan checks the speed of the train against his watch. Better move it, Bugs. Steve, Bucky, and Jones hook to the cable, stretching across the pass. Dreiner raises his hand and drops it. Steve jumps, shooting away. Jones and Bucky follow. Next year, Hydra Train roof day. The Hydra Chain rockets along. Wham, wham, wham. Steve, Bucky, and Jones drop hard into the slick roof. They meet eyes. Woo. Interior Hydra Train rear car day. Steve kicks open the back door. He and Bucky rush in. Weapons ready, only to find nothing. They look at each other. Steve heads for the next car. Next here, Hydra Train Roof Day. On the roof, Jones crawls towards the engine. In here, Hydra Train Middle Car Day. Bucky and Steve bang into the next car and find it empty. I thought, I thought they were supposed to be hauling something. Steve unhooks his shield, wary. They were. He yanks open the next connecting door, stepping into... <laughs> Interior Hydra Train, forward car day. Another darkened car. Steve and Bucky creep forward, then wham! A steel plate drops over the door, sealing them in. The lights brighten, revealing a massive Hydra trooper, six and a half feet tall and heavily armored. Both of his arms sport huge cannons. Steve and Bucky open fire, but their machine gun bullets ping uselessly off the trooper's armor. The trooper takes aim at Steve. Bam! The blue pulse blows the shield out of Steve's hand and slams him into the back wall. The shield clings to the floor. The trooper turns to Bucky and fires. Bucky dives, 
The blast rips a hole in the wall behind them. Outside a jagged ravine whips past the moonlight. A red light blinks from a camera on the ceiling. Interior Hydra train engineers booth day. Dr. Zola watches on the monitor as the troop presses in on Bucky. He leans into a microphone. No, finish the other one. Interior Hydra train forward car day. The trooper turns back to Steve as he gets to his feet. The trooper aims at the star on Steve's chest. Bucky grabs Steve's shield off the floor and leaps in front. No. Um, the cannon fires, hitting Bucky's in the shield. Pushing him through the hole in the wall with a last desperate, desperate effort. Buck snags the jagged edge. The trooper's weapon is momentarily spent by the blast. It starts to power back up. Steve lunges, grabbing Bucky's slipping mm -hmm. hand. Steve starts pulling him back in. Then, blam! The trooper fires, vaporizing Bucky's arm into a blue mist. Exterior Hydra train roof day. On the roof, Jones stares in horror as Bucky's body whips away, tumbling into a bottomless gorge. Interior Hydra train forward car day. Steve reaches out in anguish. Bucky! The only response is wind and a clatter of train wheels. The trooper takes another step. Steve grabs his shield and turns enraged. The trooper fires. This time, Steve holds on, knocking the blast away with his shield. He advances. Interior Hydra Train, Engineer's Booth Day. Zola slams his hand on the console. Again! Fire again! Interior Hydra Train, Forward Car Day. The trooper fires again. Steve deflects it and keeps coming. The trooper re-aims. Steve charges, red-eyed. He throws his shield at the trooper. Interior Hydra Train, Engineer Booth Day. The screen goes dark. Zola swallows, frightened. He turns for the train controls, then click. A 45 presses into his temple. Jones hangs from the roof, gun arm extended into the window. Stop this goddamn train. Interior Allied Headquarters, Interrogation Cell Day. We see a tabletop and hear a scrape of something that is pushed from the bottom of a frame comes. A plate of steak with potato and broccoli on the side. Tilt up to see Zola sitting looking suspicious. What is this? Reverse. Philip slides over some silverware. It's a steak. What's in it? Cow. Doctor, do you have any idea how hard it is to get a hold of a prime cut like this out here? I don't eat meat. Never? It disagrees with me. How about cyanide? Does that give you a rumbly tummy too? Philip slides the plate to his side and cuts into the meat himself, munching contentedly. Every hydra agent we try to take alive has cracked a little tablet before we can stop him. But not you. So here's my brilliant theory. You want to live. You trying to intimidate me, Colonel? Watch dinner. He slides a piece of paper over to Zola, who reads aloud. Given the valuable information he has provided, and in exchange for his full cooperation, Dr. Zola is being remanded to Switzerland. Sent that to D.C. this morning. Of course it was encoded. Say, you haven't broken those codes, have you? That would be awkward. Schmidt will know this is a lie. Still gonna kill you. Your liability, Doc. No more about Schmidt than anyone. Oh, the last man you cost us was Captain Roger's closest friend, so I wouldn't count on the very best in protection. It's you or him. That's just what you doubt. Zola knows he's right. Genuine fear tinges his response. The time you act, it will be too late. Schmidt believes he walks in the footsteps of gods. Only the world itself will satisfy him. You realize that's nuts, don't you? The sanity of the plan is of little consequence. Why is that? Because he can do it. What are his targets? Zola just looks at him, incredulous. Everywhere. Interior the whip and fiddle pub. Peggy steps through the makeshift door. Steve sips from a beer at the bar. 
you know, Dr. Erskine told me that with the serum, it wouldn't just work on my muscles and my reflexes. He said it would work on my cells, create a protective system of healing, of regenerating, which means... He turns to her, somber, but clear-eyed. Can't get drunk. Did you know that? Your metabolism burns three times faster than average. We thought it could be one of the side effects. Probably didn't want anybody stealing his schnapps. It wasn't your fault. Read the report? Yes. That's not true. You did everything you could. I got in over my head. Bucky waited and pulled me out just like he always did. And the one time he needed me to return the favor, I couldn't. I doubt it's that simple. All I had to do was hold him. Did you believe in your friend? Respect him? He looks up at her. Of course. Then stop blaming yourself. Allow Barnes the dignity of his choice. He damn well must have thought you were worth it. Steve stares at his beer. As soon as I finish this, I'm going to go after Johann Schmidt. I'm going to bring every hole there is for him to hide in. I'm not going to stop until he and all of Hydra are captured or dead. Peggy nods. Then she takes his beer and drinks it down. Let's go then. Interior Allied Headquarters Briefing Room Day. Philip stands at the head of the table, grim. Steve, Peggy, Howard, and the invaders surround him. John Schmidt belongs in the bug house. He thinks he's a god and he's going to blow up half the world to prove it. He snaps his finger at a map of the United States. Starting with the USA. That's insane. So is Hitler, but he's gotten pretty far with less than Schmidt has. But Hydra would need millions of men, fleets of transport. They'd have to be fed, fueled. Howard Schmidt's his working. head. Yeah, yeah, you know what? He uh, Schmidt's, he's working with uh, powers beyond our capabilities. He gets across the Atlantic, he'll wipe out the entire eastern seaboard in an hour. Steve stares at the map, eyes drawn inevitably to New York. Every able-bodied man we have is either here or in the Pacific. Our borders are wide open. How much time have we got? Burning my new best friend under 24 hours. Dread filled silence falls over the room. Where is he now? Phillips points to a spy photo of a mountain. Hydra's last base is here in the Alps, 500 feet below the surface. Morita gets a closer look at the map. What are we supposed to do? It's not like we could just knock on the front door. The room goes silent. Everyone turns to Steve. Exterior, exterior forest day. Steve blasts through the forest on his motorcycle. Trees whip by as he weaves through the woods. Unwittingly, he trips a wire across the ro road. A warning light blinks. Steve is flanked by Hydra guards on bikes. He opens a panel on his bike and pushes a red button. Flames shoot out from his exhaust pipe, laying down several yards of fire behind him. The nearest Hydra rider is helpless as his uniform and saddlebags catch fire. He veers into the woods and flies off a cliff, exploding in midair. One biker remains. He catches Steve on a straightaway. He pulls alongside, grinning. He reaches into the side compartment and pulls a hand grenade. Steve snatches it from him and cracks the rider in the jaw. The rider's helmet drops, blinding him. He wobbles. Steve bites down on the grenade pin, yanks it out, then tosses the grenade back in the rider's compartment. Steve throttles up and pulls away as the rider recovers. He lifts his helmet over his eyes and notices the grenade burning beside him. Boom. Interior Hydra headquarters hangar day. Red Skull stands beside a huge, mysterious wheel. He toasts eight pilots. Tomorrow, Hydra will stand master of the world, born to victory on the wings of the Valkyrie. Our enemy's weapons will be powerless against us. If they shoot down one plane, hundreds more shall rain fire upon them. 
If they cut off one head, two shall rake its place. He drinks. His pilots drink. Hail Hydra! Hail Hydra. Saul turns, and only now we see, stretching before him, 500 soldiers in formation. They salute in unison. Hail Hydra! Hail Hydra! As Skull takes in the devotion, he notices a red light flashing on the wall. He slowly turns as up above, exterior Hydra headquarters mountaintop day. Alarm sound at the surface entrance, barbed wire tops, an earthen walled compound. Hydra soldiers race to take positions. One scrambles to look over the wall only to see Steve shooting right at him. The bike ramps off a gun emplacement launches through the barbed wire and crashes into the compound. Steve crushes one guard, whipping wire slashes another. Guard open fire. Steve swerves, tossing a grenade. Boom. One guard levels a bazooka. Steve raises his shield and deflects the blast back. Finally, a hydro rifleman blows out Steve's tire. Steve front forks, digs into the ground, throwing him over the handlebars. He gets to his feet, swinging as dozens of guards move in, pummeling him from all sides. Interior Hydra headquarters, Schmidt's office de- lab day. Guards drag in Steve. He stares up at Skull's grotesque portrait. Then Skull steps from the shadows. Steve struggles. The guards hold him tight. Arrogance may not be uniquely American trait, but I will say you do it better than anyone else. Skull leans in, teeth gleaming on his crimson face. There are limits to what even you can do, Captain. Or did our skin tell you otherwise? He told me you were insane. That seemed like enough. He resented my genius and tried to deny me what was rightfully mine. Yet he gave me everything. What made you so special? Me? Nothing. He slowly raises his head, staring into Skull's sunken eyes. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Skull seeds. He smashes Steve in the face. The guards rip Steve's arm, holding him up as Skull batters him again and again. After a long time, Skull steps back. Steve pants, beaten exhausted then finally he smiles i can do this all day i believe you can but i am on a schedule he pulls his luger steve stares down the barrel so am i thunk 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 skull turns towards the window to see three specks in the distance flying straight towards the glass Skull spins back to Steve, pistols leveled, zap. Steve swings the guard around, blocking the blast. The guard is incinerated as Duncan, Hallsworth, and Joan smash through the window on the zip lines. Joan lands on Skull's desk, blasting away with his 30 cal. Interior Hydra headquarters, corridor day. The zip line extends from a powerful grappling gun. Griner hooks to the wire and shoots away. Morita barks into his radio. We're in. Go, go, go. Exterior Forest Ridge Day, off screen on a combat radio. Assault team, go. Atop a ridge, Colonel Phillips stands. You heard him. Move out. Peggy and hundreds of Alley's troops slip off out of hiding. Phillips looks to Peggy. He cocks a shotgun. Exterior Hydra headquarters, mountaintop day. Up top, Alley's soldiers open fire, pouring into the compound. Interior Hydra Headquarters, Schmidt's Office Lab, Day. Duncan lands a haymaker. Steve knocks out the other guard. Skull gets off a few blasts as he backs out the door down the hall. Allie's soldiers blow through the double doors. Fallsworth cuts down a guard, taking the shield from him. He tosses it to Steve. Thanks. Cheers. Steve straps the shield and races after Skull. Interior Hydra Headquarters, Corridor, Day. Four Hydra troops back up to the entrance, firing. Blam! One false shot. 
A second tries to lob a grenade. Bam! He falls, dropping the grenade at the feet of the third. Boom! Trapped. The last one panics, hung, fumbling in his mouth. Cut off one head, two more shall rise. Bam! The soldier falls dead. Reverse. Colonel Phillips stands there, shotgun smoking. Let's go find two more. A dozen Marines follow him inside. Interior Hydra headquarters corridor day. Skull runs down a corridor, jackboots pounding. Steve tears after him, racing around the corner, only to met, be met by a vicious barrage. Schmidt unloads his Luger, blasting blue bolts. Steve barely gets his shield up in time. Interior Hydra headquarters corridor day. Schmidt races past an intersect corridor. He dashes through a doorway and hits a button. Blasting doors begin to close. Steve spots the closing doors. He calculates and hurls his shield. It whirls down the corridor and thunk, jams between the doors, holding them open. Steve takes off after Schmidt, but a Hydra flame trooper stomps out the intersecting corridor, blocking his way. The flame trooper raises his twin guns. Steve raises his arms only to realize his shield is stuck in the door. Uh-oh. Blue fire, fire flickers from the troop's nozzle. Then, bam, the trooper staggers. The tank on his back explodes. Peggy steps out of the corridor, rifle in hand. You're late. Tell me you're not, not complaining. Once you're about to. Right. He sprints for the door, sliding between the shield, grabbing it as he goes. The door slams behind him. He waves on a squad of SSR troops behind her. Interior Hydra headquarters, corridor day. Dreiner and Fourth fight along a corridor, outnumbered. Fourth nods to Dreiner. They retreat around a bend. Surprised, the Hydra troopers give chase. After a moment, the Hydra troopers come running back. Duncan steps out, firing a Hydra cannon. Blam! Here's suborbital bomber cockpit day. Inside the bomber, bomber, dim monitors line an impressive cockpit. A high-tech cradle stands in the center. Skull approaches, carrying the titanium box. He places it over the cradle and dispenses the cube. Blue circuits flash, lights and gauges flicker. Interior Hydra headquarters corridor day. Steve runs towards the other door. Beyond a huge hangar looms. Suddenly, a deep rumbling shakes the base. Steve gapes. Through the doorway, he sees a gigantic plane rolling past. It dwarfs any we have seen thus far. Interior Hydra headquarters hangar day. Steve skids into the hangar. The massive plane taxis down the runway. In the shadows, five more bombers wait. Schmidt plane picks up speed. Steve takes off after it. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Skull throttles up. He presses a button. Interior hydra headquartered hangar day. At the far end, a door opens, letting in the glare of daylight. Steve chases after the plane, but the huge bomber picks up speed. It starts to pull away. Suddenly, an engine revs. Schmidt's car comes up alongside the still running Steve. Colonel Phillips behind the wheel. Get in. Steve jumps in without the car ever slowing down. In the back, Peggy, cham mm. Peggy chambers around into Phillips' shotgun. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit. Skull accelerates. On his monitor, he spies his car. Interior Hydra headquarters hangar dead. Philip gains on the plane. Just then, the bomber's rear propeller spin into a blur. The plane widens the gap. Philip spots a toggle switch on the dash. Compressor. He hits it. Whoosh! The car leaps forward, pulling them back. Steve climbs over the windshield, steadies himself. Get closer. Phillips floors it. The car surges towards the propellers. Steve drops just as the propellers shave off the Hydra hood <clears throat> ornament. He and Peggy share a worried look. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Skull races for the mouth of the tunnel on the monitor. Interior Hydra headquarter hangar day. 
Phillips comes up alongside the plane's huge tire. Hold it steady this time. Wait. Peggy grabs Steve by the neck and kisses him. When they break off, Steve looks at her wide-eyed. Go get him. Steve nods, stunned. He looks to Phillips. I'm not kissing you. In Pierce's suborbital bomber cockpit day, Skull punches the throttle, the speedometer redlining. Interior Hydra headquarter hangar day, Steve braces himself on the hood. Phillips pulls two within inches of the spinning wheel. Just then, exterior Hydra headquarters cliff day, the plane bursts out of the tunnel. Phillips spots the gorge ahead. He slams on the brake. At the last moment, Steve leaps to the landing gear. The plane shoots over the edge, sailing into the air. Phillips to a stop, Peggy sees Steve hanging on. Woo. Hatch to your suborbital bomber landing gear day. Steve locks his arm around the struts. The plane gains altitude. He looks for a way in. Just then, the landing gear groans. The wheels retract. Steve finds himself riding the landing gear right into interior suborbital bomber flight deck day. The flight deck. Steve stares awestruck. He realizes the propellers are attached to eight fighters inside the wing. Each features a snub nose cube bomb as its nose cone. Zing! A bullet ricochets off of Steve's shield. He spins as the eight pilots rush down a ramp from the bridge. Steve flips into a flying spin kick, dropping two pilots where they stand. The others move in on him. He throws one across the flight deck and out of the plane. He smashes another with his shield. A huge pilot faces off against Steve. He swings a chalk, clocking Steve in the head. Steve staggers onto a fighter. The big pilot leaps on him. Inside the fighter's cockpit, another pilot sees his chance. He pulls the release lever. The fight fighter drops with Steve and the pilot still aboard. Interior exterior pod fighter day. Steve holds on as the fighter shoots through the air. The big pilot hangs on to Steve's boot. Steve kicks once, twice. The big pilot loses his grip, tumbling into the propeller. Ew. Inside, the fighter pilot looks up astonished to see Steve still hanging on. He executes a barrel roll. Steve's eyes roll back, skin rippling from the G-force. The pilot jerks the stick, but Steve holds himself forward. He grasps the edge of the cockpit and slides it open. The pilot evades Steve's grasping hand. Then Steve reaches down and pulls the ejector switch. The pilot blunts into the sky, switching into the underside of the bomber's wing. Steve climbs in and holds on the stick, riding the plane. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Skull checks an electronic map showing the map plane's progress towards America. Then he looks out the windshield and freezes. Steve's ragged fighter comes swooping up out of the clouds, propeller whirling. Interior pod fighter day. Steve yanks the stick, flying shakily towards the flight deck. Interior suborbital bomber, flight deck day. Steve's pod fighter skids across the flight deck, finally coming to a stop in a shower of sparks and screeching metal. Steve pushes the canopy off and climbs from the wreck. He straps on his shield and looks towards the cockpit. Interior suborbital bomber, cockpit day. Steve kicks open the door to find stillness. He steps warily towards the control platform. He sees the pilot's chair empty. Suddenly, he hears the whine of a Hydra assault rifle powering up. His eyes dart to the window where he sees the reflection of Skull aiming at his back. Steve whips around, shield raised, deflecting Skull's shot. The blast, blast ricochets, blowing out a plane of the blowing out a pane of the cockpit glass. Wind roars. You don't give up, do you? Nope. Steve charges at Skull, who fires again. Blue bolts ricochet around the cabin. Steve swings, flashing the rifle from Skull's hand. Skull swings. Steve puts Skull in a headlock. Skull throws Steve into a bolt head. Steve swings his shield, but Skull grabs it with both hands. The two super soldiers strain eye to eye. You wear a flag on your chest and think you fight a battle of nations. 
I have seen the future, Captain. There are no flags but Hydra's. Keep the future. I'm looking for a little here and now. Steve slams Skull in the jaw with his shield. Skull staggers. Steve cocks back and hits Skull with an <sighs> uppercut. The impact drives Skull up and into the autopilot controls. The autopilot disengages. The plane lurches violently. A fierce suborbital bomber day. The massive plane spins into a barrel roll. Through the cockpit window, we see Steve and Skull tumbling to the ceiling. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Steve and Skull crash across the whirling cockpit. Steve grasps for a handhold. The plane jerks again, throwing them together. They crumble in chaotic zero G. Steve Skull into the ceiling. Skull eyeballs. The Skull elbows Steve into the wall. Skull tries to reach the autopilot, but Steve uses his momentum to swing around a truck and slam his shield into Skull's head. Skull bashes against the wall, but adeptly bounces back. He grabs a strut and kicks Steve towards the back bulkhead. Skull flies at the autopilot controls. Wham! Steve swings hard into the steel wall. Skull finds a handhold and hits the autopilot button. Here's suborbital bomber day. The giant plane pulls out of its dive. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Gravity returns with sudden violence. Steve smashes to the floor. His shield rolling away. Steve lies momentarily dazed. His eyes flutter. Then... You could have the power of the gods. Steve looks up to see Skull advancing. Luger drawn. You will not admit you want it. Standing in front of the cube housing, Skull takes dead aim at the star on Steve's chest. I want every soldier on every battlefield point. Steve eyes the shield at his feet. I want to go home. Steve slams his heel <sighs> into the shield, slipping into the air. Skull fires. Steve jumps to his feet, grabbing the shield, blocking the blast. He whirls and hurls his shield. The spinning disc hits Skull in the rib with a sickening crunch, knocking him off his feet, smashing him into the cube console. Blue energy arcs and crackles from the damage machinery. The energy gauge pins at overload. Skull pulls himself to his feet, staring in alarm as the cube rises from the machine, glowing with a violent intensity. Skull stares. He reaches out and extracts the cube. Steve gapes as the cube burns the glove off Skull's hand, exposing the scarred flesh. The Skull just stares, overcome and amazed. Blinded by the light, Steve staggers towards the controls. Skull's point of view, the plane seems to vanish from around him. Visions of the nine realms dance in the light. A rainbow portal stretches past an observatory and into space. Bahala, I was right. It is real. Yes, I understand. I have waited so long. The visions speed up until they blur. Suddenly the cube vibrates violently. The skull looks worried. Something's wrong. No. Steve whips up his shield as energy sh shoots from the cube. Nine! Energy bolts ricochet off the ceiling and strike the skull, vaporizing him as the cube goes nova. Exterior suborbital bomber day. A massive column of energy shoots towards space, growing in intensity until it explodes outward, evaporating the clouds. Light glares through the cockpit windows, then fades. The plane whips past. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Steve stands, woozy. Then his vision returns. He sees the inert cube. He takes a step towards it. Suddenly, the plane banks violently, its engines roaring. Steve races for the controls. The forgotten cube tumbles across the flight deck. Think think, think, and flies out a hole in the, in the fuselage. 
Steve climbs into the chair. The control stick steers automatically. Steve wrestles it, trying to override the plane, but it will not alter course. Steve stares at the monitor and the green map, map of Manhattan. Interior Hydra headquarters, control tower day. The radio squawks in the empty control room. Agent Carter, come in. Peggy runs in and grabs the radio, frantic and relieved. Steve, is that you? Are you okay? I'm fine. Through the window, we see the invaders rounding up the sur sur surrendering Hydra men. Where's Schmidt? Schmidt's dead. What about the plane? It's a little bit harder to explain. Intercut. Interior suborbital bomber cockpit day. Steve stares at the New York map, radio in hand. His compass lies open on the control board. Give me your coordinates. I'll find a landing site. There isn't going to be a landing. Schmidt's locked the navigation system. Steve eyes the red-lined engine gauges in front of him. There's more than enough power to reach the East Coast. Peggy looks grave. She waves Colonel Phillips down. I'll get Howard on the line. He'll know what to do. I'm setting on 100 tons of explosives. Hot wiring this thing is not an option. He looks out the window at the vast blue expanse of ocean. I gotta put it in the water. Peggy spreads, spreads her fingers on the wall, her knuckles white. But you, you said you couldn't steer it. Steve scans the control panel. He spots a thick cable running from the ignition to the engines. I, I can't, but I think I can crash it. He yanks the cable out. Blue sparks flare, then all the lights die. The engines stop. The plane goes quiet. Steve, don't do this. We've got time. We've, we can figure this out. Steve eyes the navigation charts. I already did. Right now, I'm in the middle of nowhere. If I wait any longer, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Peggy. This is my choice. Peggy and Phillips look at each other, slowly accepting what's happening. We'll, we'll send out rescue ships. We'll, we'll find you. I'm not going to be much left to find. Steve leans on the stick with all his might. The plane begins a screaming dive. Peggy? I'm here. Steve's compass spins wildly. He just stares at her picture. I'm gonna need a rain check on that dance. All right. A week Saturday, the stalk club. Okay, you got it. Eight o'clock on the dot. If you're three minutes late, I'm leaving. Do you understand? I still don't know how to dance. She closes her eyes. I'll show you, I'll show you everything. Just be there. Clouds whip past the windows as the plane plummets. Steve pockets the compass and slides his mask over his face. Arctic ice rushes up at the cockpit window. Maybe the bank will play something slow. I hate to <laughs> the radio and Peggy's hand goes silent. Colonel Phillips puts his hand on her shoulder. She just stares at the hangar, at the blue sky beyond. Exterior Arctic Ocean Day. The plane skids violently across a glacier that it careens off the edge and crashes into an icy lake. The plane floats a moment, then starts to sink, bleed into the sound of a cheering crowd. Exterior Truff Falgars square day. People lean from balconies holding the V for victory sign. A paper on the newsstand reads war over. Interior the whip and fiddle pub day. Amidst the revelry, Moritha, Jones, Dreiner, Fallsworth, and Dungan stand at attention. Their bags rest against the wall. They solemnly raise their glasses. Exterior underwater day. 
The plane sinks slowly into the icy water. Next here is Stark Search Boat Day. A trawler bobs on the ocean surface at anchor. All sorts of antennae sprout from the wheelhouse. In here Stark Search Boat Wheelhouse Day. Howard Stark hunches over a monitor on, on a high-tech bridge. His assistants eye sonar and radiation detectors. One feature at a steady green blip. On Howard's screen, grainy video footage of the sea bottom, sand and fish roll past as the camera explores the terrain. Howard peers, he stops the camera sub, adjusting the monitor, bringing into focus. The cracked, inert, cosmic cube. He operates a pair of joysticks on screen. Two robotic claws extend. They reach out and clasp the cube. Howard exhales and looks to his assistant. Move us to the next grid point. But there's no trace of wreckage, sir, and the energy signature stops here. Stark pushes back from the monitor, spent, grim. Just keep looking. Next year, Arctic Ocean Day, the plane's wingtips slip below the ice. Next year, underwater day, we see Steve's shadow through the cockpit window. He slumps, strapped in his chair. Interior Allied Headquarters Briefing Room Day, Philip signs an official report, classified Captain America. He stamps it inactive. He slides it into a red box marked to be destroyed. He looks up as Peggy walks in. He regards her stoic, suppressing his emotions. No one said we had to forget the man agent. Peggy nods. She picks up the box and puts it with the others on a table near the door. For a moment, she just stands there, overwhelmed. She opens the box, taking out a photo of pre-rebirth Steve. She smiles, then she tucks it in her breast pocket. She closes the box and leaves. Exterior underwater day. Back away from the window until the plane is just a shadow. Exterior lower east side day. On a New York street, two boys play. One fires a toy gun, the other blocks imaginary bullets with a garbage can lid. Fade to black. After a moment, we can hear ever so faintly the sound of Brooklyn Dodgers game on the radio. Next year, 1945 room day, close on Steve's face. He looks paler, thinner, but alive. His eyes flicker open, he sees an old glass light fixture on a white ceiling. He sits up and finds he's on a bed in a quiet 1940s room. The sun shines through the white curtains, the Dodgers game plays, and an old vacuum tube radio on a, on a wooden dresser. We've been up for the Phillies now, holding that big club down at the end. He sets Chipman, pitches, curveball outside, ball one. Steve slides his bare feet to the worn wooden floor. Good morning. Steve turns to see a pretty 1940s brunette sitting in a chair. She folds a copy of the Brooklyn Eagle and checks her watch. Or should I say afternoon? I, I don't remember going to sleep. Well, it was quite a while ago. Steve rubs his face. The radio plays. The Dodgers are ahead eight to five, and Chipman knows one swing of the bat and his and this fella's capable of making a brand making it a brand new game. Steve eyes the radio. He takes a long look at her. How long have I been out? Outfield deep, round towards left in the infield over shifted. I'm afraid it, I couldn't say. With lightning speed, Steve grabs her arm. Captain Rogers, please. Who are you? How do you know my name? We know all about you. Just then, a large menacing man in strangely modern garb rushes into the room. He carries a set of metal restraints. Here's the pitch from Chipman. Steve lets go of the SSR agent. He stares red-eyed at the man move at the man moves in on him, as the man moves in on him. 
swung on, belted. It's a long one, deep into the left center. Back goes Galan. Back, back, back. Into your hallway day, suddenly, bam! A door explodes into the hallway, blown off its hinges by the flying body of the manacled man. Steve staggers out. Into your lobby day, Steve races into a busy modern lobby. Shield operative stare, MPs appear ahead of him. Halt! Steve bowls them over and runs for the door. Exterior shield hospital day. Steve bursts outside. He takes a few steps, then stops. Modern cars honk and roar in the streets. Powering plasma billboards playing moving ads feature lots of flesh. Modern people rush past iPods and cell phones to their ears. Steve staggers, confused. He glances over his shoulder to see the MPs rushing out. Steve takes off, sprinting down the crowded sidewalk. Exterior New York City alleyway day. Steve skids into an alley and stops, panting, freaked. Steve looks down the alley only to find it's a dead end. At ease, soldier. Steve whips to see Nick Fury standing alone at the alley entrance. Who are you? Colonel Nick Fury, Director of Shield. You would have had you would have you would have known us at the Special Scientific Reserve. Steve's eyes narrow, the first reassuring thing he's heard. Where am I? Round about 34 and 5th. Steve looks confused. Fury nods over his, over his shoulder at the Empire State Building rising above them. Steve gates. Fury waves a couple of MPs to block off the alley. They stand at attention. Sorry about the little show back there. See, there's no precedent for what you've been through. We couldn't tell how delicate your mental state might be. We thought it might be best to break it to you slowly. Break what? You've been asleep, Captain, for almost 70 years. Steve looks around, stunned. 70. The world of the future. Well, thanks to you, there is one. Steve eyes Fury. What about the board? Did, did we win? Hell yes. Unconditional surrender, baby. And taking down Hydra was a big part of that. Steve reels. How am I not dead? To be perfectly honest, we're not sure yet. My docs say it's some kind of suspended animation. Dr. Erkstein's formula, the extreme cold, I can't break it down for you on a cellular level, but you haven't aged a day since that plane went down. Steve looks around, overwhelmed. Above him, a highway sign reads, FDR Drive, next left. You don't mind my asking, what gave us away back there? What? Oh, um, Bob Chipman was traded for Eddie Stanky during the 44 season. He's with the Cubs now. Or was. I know it's a lot to swallow, but the world's not as different as it looks. There's still work to be done. Soldiers work. Steve meets Fury's eyes. Fury signals to one of the MPs. He brings forward a case. Fury opens it, revealing Steve's battered shield. The world could still use a man like you, Cap. Steve touches the shield, remembering. Take your time. God knows if anybody's earned it, you have. All the same. Fury offers his hand. Steve takes it. There's a place for you on the team. Steve rubs his head. So many things coming back. You sure you're all right? Yeah, it's just... Push in on Steve's stunned face. I have a date. Fade out. And that is Captain America the First Avenger!
Have y'all a good were awesome. And we'll see y'all at the next one.